morning, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order, Monday, the 24th of October in 2022. Thank you for being here with us this evening in the chambers. Thanks for everybody who's tuning in online. We're going to start our meeting as we always do. If you could, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Once again, thank you all for being here. First order of a, uh, item of uh, order tonight, we have to approve our agenda. On the agenda tonight, Council, uh, we have two introductory items. We have a proclamation regarding Native American Heritage Month and an update on our park, planning, our park project planning. Consent business, we have only four items on the consent business tonight. Councilmember Carter will be handling the consent items for us. Nothing under item four are hearings, resolutions, and ordinances, but under organizational business, we do have uh, six items. The first being uh, item 5.1, which is the consideration of the artistry request for financial assistance with a public comment opportunity. We have uh, then some budget discussions, many of which we kind of uh, punted on last week because we ran up against the, the deadline for our time. 5.2, we're going to be talking about information technology. 5.3, we'll talk public safety. 5.4, we'll talk fleet and facilities, internal service funds, and public works general fund budgets. And 5.5, we will talk the legal department budget. And we will wrap up the night as we always do with item 5.6, our city council policy and issue update. Council, any corrections or updates to tonight's agenda? Hearing none, I would move approval of tonight's agenda as stated. Second. Got a motion and a second to accept tonight's agenda. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries 7-0. We have an agenda. First item on that agenda is a proclamation for Native American Heritage Month. And I'm gonna head down to the podium here. So November is officially Native American Heritage Month. It's a time to uh, acknowledge and to celebrate our history and the culture and the traditions of the Native American peoples who called Bloomington, or called Bloomington and Minnesota home and have for centuries. It's also about uh, educating the public about the tribes and to raise awareness about the unique challenges faced by Native American people, both past and present times. So our first and only proclamation this evening, Native American Heritage Month, November 2022. Whereas, during Native American Heritage Month, we celebrate the rich tapestry of indigenous peoples and honor their vibrant and diverse cultures, which we recognize as inextricably woven into the history and present times of this country. And whereas the city of Bloomington is built on lands once known by Native Americans as where the water touches the bluffs and where sacred burial mounds of the ones who came before us remain. And whereas Native Americans have a long and rich history and presence in Bloomington, including Dakota, Ojibwe, and Iowa Indians, and we recognize the 11 tribal nations that call Minnesota home. And whereas the Bloomington City Council resolves to support their legacy and preserve their sacred heritage for generations to come. And whereas the Bloomington City Council includes equity and inclusion as one of its strategic priorities and strives to make continued and meaningful progress toward equity and inclusion for Native Americans. And whereas the Bloomington City Council recommits to supporting Native Americans and working side by side with their leaders to secure stronger and safer communities. And whereas during the month of November, we commemorate the rich and diverse culture of Native American people and recognize their continued contributions in strengthening the diversity of our society. Now therefore, I, Mayor Tim Bussey, do hereby proclaim November as Native American Heritage Month in the city of Bloomington, dated this 24th day of October, 2022. Uh, as I said, this is a, an annual, or I might not have said, but it's an annual proclamation we read here at the, the city of Bloomington. It's an important proclamation considering the history of this community, where our community is, and, uh, and what still remains within this community, both, uh, both legacy and current day uh, reminders of, of the history that, uh, of this area, the people who came here well before us, and uh, the legacy that they left behind. So very happy and proud to proclaim November is Native American Heritage Month here in Bloomington. Thank you. 
Item two on our agenda is a park project planning update. Renee Clark, our assistant director of parks and park projects, is here to lead us through our pro uh, this presentation. Good evening. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor Bussey and members of council. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to be at this point in the planning process where we went from park master planning, looking at our park system, to now looking at individual parks and envisioning with you all and our community um, what those can look like. Tonight I'm going to cover um, just a bit of background on the park master plan and how we are moving those next steps forward through this project. Talk about process, schedule, and key milestones for the park planning we're working on right now. Uh, request of council to review the plans and next steps in the project. First to recall that the park master plan we did um, together with you and the community is a guiding document to help us make decisions about where to invest in our large park system of 97 parks, knowing that we can't effectively um, make changes to everything at once. So it's a roadmap, but not an individual plan for parks. Through extensive community engagement, these four priority park elements emerged and are guiding to the work that we do in our park planning, natural resources, trails, new park amenities, and equity. And you'll see those themes throughout the plans that we're looking at. The park master plan concludes with section 404 of how we get there and includes a specific action plan with actions in 10 categories this project addresses the six categories that I've highlighted here, including the top four priority action areas. Altogether, we're addressing 15 recommendations in these six categories through this project. Specifically in the action plan, the level of service section um, says to update individual park plans to meet current resident needs, utilizing a community-driven planning process to ensure neighborhood needs are considered and all are incorporated into redevelopment plans. And this was a key um, guiding principle from the park master plan work we did, that our work would be done together with the community. The project then is doing park concept plannings for nine individual parks uh, shown on the screen from um, starting with Sunrise, Southwood, Brookside, Trepa, Poplar Bridge, Bryant, Smith, Running, and Kelly. Through the contract that we're working on right now with this project, we are also taking Bryant Park and Trepa Park to 30% design development to prepare for 2024 capital projects at those sites identified in our CIP. The sites were selected largely to site major park amenities. The park master plan through community engagement with our staff, council, and commissions identified locations for major park amenities shown on this map. This map was created with input um, through that process, citing locations of park shelter buildings, inclusive play areas, and other major amenities. And so this is where we, um, how we're guided to um, plan the nine parks with the shelter buildings highlighted in yellow. And why we're doing this project. Um, first, so to support financial planning and help guide the estimates that we put in our capital improvement plan every year. Secondly, to cite major park amenities like new playgrounds, um, we're talking about new inclusive playgrounds and park shelter buildings, all are reliant and affected by uh, a site redevelopment overall. These concept plans will allow us to incrementally make changes to parks, like replacement of a playground at Smith that the council authorized through um, community strategic priorities money. Um, for next year, we'll be doing that absent a full park renovation, but guided by the concept plans that we're doing through this project. It'll identify in the same way opportunities to do clean water and natural resources restoration in our parks. That it's, it's ongoing work and it'll be guided by this work through the um, concept plans that we're developing, developing. And then just to note, and I'll, I'll remind us all at the end, the community engagement doesn't stop when we're done with the concept plans. Community engagement continues when concept plans come up in our CIP and move into design development as well. 
This work is being led um, by Parks and myself in Parks and Recreation, but inclusive of a large design team um, from several departments across the city. And I just wanted to um, note all those that are um, working really hard with me on the project. So then the process, I've developed into um, four categories where we um, started by uh, going to the community and getting testing ideas for what kinds of experiences and things do you want to do in parks. So we tested ideas not on an individual park basis, but generally what do you want to do and see in this park. Um, then we took that those ideas, worked with staff to develop two concept plans that we're currently testing. We'll finalize those concept plans into one single plan for each of the nine parks and then take Bryant and Trepa again to uh, a 30% design. So the initiate phase was largely and entirely community engagement. We used Let's Talk Bloomington, um, did events with ice cream in all nine parks. You can see in the background um, Council Member D'Alessandro with our icicle tricycle um, where we encouraged people to come out for ice cream and, and share their thoughts. We did this in all nine parks. We average about 30 um, residents at each park. We went to Summerfet, um, had, uh, went to the farmer's market, Creekside, Southgate, um, as well as uh, the Kennedy High School um, more recently with the two concepts. We then um, took those two concepts, all the information we got, and had what we called Parkapalooza. We did an informational video about that that you may have seen um, on Bloomington Buzz and our website. But we invited the planning team that you saw earlier um, of staff to come with our landscape architects, which were stationed um, one park and landscape architect per table, and staff provided input. It was a one-day event. We had a really large participation from across the city and one of the most fun things I've been a part of um, in my career. It was, it was really fun. Fun to see the landscape architects at work as well as um, learning from all my colleagues. That information, along with everything we collected from the public, was um, synthesized into the two plans that we're looking at today. Tonight I'm here um, with the concept plans as well as a concept for a park shelter building which is being done on the same timeline under a separate consultant contract um, to ask for council's input. And how I'd like to receive that input for, for efficiency versus uh, discussion at a meeting is um, information that was included in the council packet tonight was provided hard copy, the set of nine concept plans and the building uh, park building concept with the interior floor plan. If council could please review those and share your comments to um, us through Matt. Uh, what, you know, think of questions like what's too much? What do you think might be missing? What are things, you know, either park specific or generally in the park system that you'd like to see us include, um, include in Bloomington parks? Other things that we've asked, um, you know, our staff teams and commission, distribution of amenities across the city, um, change of use, fields and courts that we've been looking very closely at too. We're also talking about um, this with our athletic associations. I'd like to receive that input by a week from tomorrow, November 1st. We will use that input along with the other input we've received to finalize um, go from two to one concepts, and that will start with a staff workshop, a little bit smaller than Parkapalooza, but a, a, a half day, a little more than a half day workshop with our design team to give them direction on how to make these two concept into one concepts per park. Those will be done up in the December time frame and come back to council and the public for vetting through about the end of February where we will then be bringing just Bryant and Trepa back for your review so we can continue those on the path to 30% design. At the same time, we'll be finalizing the concepts for the other seven parks 
in April time frame, Bryant and Trepa's 30% design and the other seven park concept designs will come for council for final approval. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Ms. Clark. That's uh, a, a very dense project. It seems like a, there's a lot going on, and it's very thorough and complete every step of the way, and I appreciate that. So well done. And uh, you mentioned this won't be as, the next step won't be as big as Park of Palooza. I can't imagine it being bigger than Park of Palooza, really. It's, uh, it would have to be smaller in one way, shape, or form. But uh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the, the information. And, and we will get this council. We will commit to getting comments back by the 1st of November, will we not? Absolutely. Very good. We will. <laughs> council. Tuesday. That's next Tuesday. That's next Tuesday. I know what you're doing on Halloween night. So, <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for the cameos in the presentation, Renee. I appreciate that. Uh, that's harder to drive than you think. So, uh, <laughs> if you if you saw me fail at it, then <laughs> um, a quick question: um, Can you describe for us just the volume of comments that you got over the course of the time that you were out with the community? Um, and can just share with us, not necessarily specifics, but yeah. you can kind of tell us how many different kinds of folks you talk to and other things like that. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Daryl Sandro, thank you for the question. And we're really excited about the participation. I estimated about 30 um, attendees per site, which we went to twice. So uh, 540, nine, nine parks twice. Um, we really felt the neighbors were represented in the in the visits we had about 1900 visits to let's talk bloomington um, with 254 comments um, and estimating you know meeting hundreds of people at events including um, the summer fete and um, farmers market particularly we've had a short blurb in um, the briefings this summer referring people to let's talk bloomington mailed postcards to residents all within um, a one mile radius of the parks. So um, as to share information about the project. So that that's a kind of a brief snapshot of the summary of people we've been meeting. So you talked to a lot of folks. We have. Absolutely. Council, additional questions? Council Member Lohman. I just want to say just thank you. I mean, uh, it, this is it's incredible uh, having having the opportunity to to see how uh, these parks have been when I was younger to see how now it's going to serve a new generation of uh, young folks perhaps maybe my kid <laughs> so um, I, I just again just thank you and I just love the the, the engagement in the, the the process and I think that's all I really want to say thank you thank you and thank you all for your participation. Absolutely. Thank you. Looking forward as this process moves along. And I'm encouraged by it. I think every step of the way from the, the beginning of the park master planning process, it has really been, a, as I said, a, a thorough and exacting process, I think, that brings out the best answers to the, any of the questions that we might have. So kudos to you for the work that you put into this and the work that you're going to continue as we get Bloomington Parks updated and ready for the, the next generation of Dwayne's kids to play on. So, 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 great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Item three on our agenda is our consent business. Councilmember Carter has our consent business this evening. Councilmember Carter. I do. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have not heard of any holds. Does anybody want to hold anything? Okay, I don't see any. So, with that, I would move to approve 3.1 through 3.4. Second. Motion by Councilmember Carter, second by Councilmember Lohman to accept tonight's consent agenda. Hearing no further council discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. As I mentioned, we have nothing under item four tonight, our hearings and resolutions and ordinances. We will move on to item five, 5.1, and uh, the consideration of the artistry request for financial assistance with a public comment opportunity. A uh, couple of things that I want to do here, we'll, we'll frame it up really quick, and then I know there's a lot of folks who would like to speak to this this evening. What we're going to do to uh, make sure everybody gets an opportunity, we're going to limit comments to three minutes each, and everybody will have an opportunity to speak, and we will, we will talk our way through this. Once we close the public comment opportunity, we'll have a discussion among staff up here, and we will 
we will move forward with uh, any decision that would be made. So, Council, uh, we went through this uh, in great detail last week, and uh, you know the, the issue before us. You saw the, uh, the memo from the city manager about the different options that we had brought forward, that he has brought forward. Um, Mr. Verbrugge, you moved your microphone. Did you want to say something, or I wasn't sure if you were going to chime in here? I was just preparing for uh, questions. Mr. Oh, very good, very good. The three different options that uh, w were laid out by staff, the first was to obviously to fund artistry to approve the $750,000 loan. Um, option number two would be to reject the $750,000 loan, but to maintain programming. And th that would continue four primary areas of operation in this assumption. That would include the box office, the gallery programs, uh, on-site education only, and tuition-based classes and then a scenario where the Schneider Theater would be used as a, uh, a would host traveling productions. Um, I think it's described as roadhouse theater scenario in the, uh, in the uh, agenda packet. And then the, the final would be, uh, option three would be no funding and minimal programming, which uh, I think can be, you can probably sh shape up in your mind what that would look like in terms of the no funding and the lack of uh, programming that we would have. And um, that would, uh, that would basically end up, uh, as you see in the agenda packet, uh, the scenario is roughly $230,000. The box office operation would be approximately uh, $1,000, or excuse me, $110,000 for staffing and software. Visual arts would be roughly $95,000 for staffing and technical operations would cost roughly $25,000. Now, Mr. Verbrugge has. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just, yeah, just a couple points of uh, additional information, especially related to the option two and option three. Um, it's, it's clear in the memo to the council, but I don't want to assume that everybody uh, here has seen that memo. The the assumption for those options is that um, if artistry's request is not funded, that they would likely uh, cease operations. Um, now that's not a certainty, but that was the assumption we made for the purpose of those options. I think that artistry has indicated in testimony to the council um, that there, there weren't other opportunities uh, for uh, them to go to for this level of uh, financial support and so if that is the case then um, it doesn't seem like there are other options but I don't want to um, be sitting here telling you that that is the case I think that's the responsibility of artistry I've just prepared these options understanding that um, that seems like a uh, potential scenario if the council chooses not to fund them thank you for the clarification mr. Verbrugge and I apologize for not making that clear as we as I, as I frame this up council any Questions of Mr. Verbrugge or anything as we get started here? Very good. Uh, as okay. I said, folks who are here in the... Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I, I thought I... Uh, so j just for the second option, we didn't really mention um, how much that would be for that um, uh, that funding piece of that. So if we can sure. clarify it. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Lohman, the um, option two uh, assumed, again, that... Uh, if artistry request was not funded and uh, artistry ceased to operate, um, it, it assumes the city uh, stepping in to take responsibility for maintaining as much of the activity in the art center uh, as is currently uh, provided by artistry. And in that scenario, uh, the annual cost is about $1 million. And I think that is um, a a much higher number than would actually be realized in the first year for this reason is that um, establishing a roadhouse theater or some other theater operating model will likely take some time and the costs associated with running the theater which make up a good amount of that one million dollars would likely not be incurred in the first year or certainly not within the first six to nine months because um, putting together a, a schedule for companies to perform in the theater will take a fair amount of lead time uh, sometimes as much as a year or more uh, to set those uh, schedules so that number is probably a reflection of what would happen maybe in years two or three once we set it up so to be clear uh, it'd be a, a after the the startup fee whatever that would be one million dollars uh, each year probably after that including the first year 
Um, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman, keep in mind that we had very little time to put that cost together, so that's an estimate. Um, but I, th I think that's as close as we can come with the information that we have. Well, and that would be on, not getting any breaks from yeah. me. <laughs> well, and, and again, that's on the expense side too, and so that's not a net number because there are obviously revenues that are going to come in from operating various aspects of the of, of the arts programming. Um, and it's just we don't have enough information to estimate what those are except to be explicit and say this is not a net number. That's the max. That's the number on the expense side. Thank you for that clarification, Councilmember Lohman and Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you for doing that. So as we open up our public comment opportunity here, uh, here's what I would like to ask of all of you. As I said, we're gonna, we've got our, the shot clock of three minutes there to, to make sure that we keep everybody within the same time period and we're gonna, be, we're gonna stick to that to make sure everybody has the same amount of time and opportunity to speak. Uh, the first person up, I, would, I need everybody to, to sign in and we've got the clipboard with the sign in sheet right up there. And as you sign in, if you could turn around to the person behind you and hand them the clipboard so they can sign in while you're speaking, and then we can kind of keep this moving with a, with a decent flow to it. What I would appreciate from everybody as you do come up, uh, walk up, state your name. Uh, you don't have to state your address, but just state your name, just so we have it for the record and clearly, and we understand who you are, and uh, we will move forward on this. I don't think, if there are no questions, why don't we get started? We can do this. So, uh, again, if you'd, whoever would like to start us off, come on forward, please, and uh, then if, start to queue up in behind and um, make sure we get signed in and make this as efficient as possible. Don't be shy. Look at that, and if you could take that, perfect. It's working like a charm so far. Good evening, welcome. Oh, honorable, honorable Mayor and members of the City Council, uh, good evening. My name is Mary Vasily. I'm the chair of the Continental Ballet Company. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you at this time. I will be brief. Uh, my main object in speaking uh, is to make sure you have all the correct information th that you need to make your decision. I do not come here to try to influence uh, the council to vote one way or the other. Um, again, I, I just want uh, the council to have the correct information when they do decide um, on, the, on the proposal. I also wanna make a couple of suggestions as to how to handle certain matters that may impact Continental Ballet if the council does not fund artistry. So regarding the facts, the resident arts organizations will not succeed or fail, in our opinion, based on your decision as to artistry's request. Uh, specifically, Continental's operations will not be affected whether artistry does or does not receive additional funding from the city. We have always been financially independent from artistry. For example, Continental does not use artistry's box office for ticketing. We have been operating our own box office since the Arts Center opened. We found that using brown paper tickets for online sales costs us absolutely nothing. The program is easy to learn so that our staff can also sell tickets from the program to walk, to walk up sales and day of event sales. I'm certain that the city's information desk staff could easily learn the program for day of event sales and it is something to consider if the city would rather not take on the expense of operating uh, a box office. I would also like to make just two requests. First, oh, I, I meant to say uh, in the same way Continental has always hired its own stage crew as well. It uh, does not depend on artistry for that or anything else. But the two requests I'd like to make are that first, um, the Cultural Arts Fund has been distributed to resident arts organizations for 40 years, more than 40 years. First, through the Bloomington Fine Arts Council, and more recently, through the cultural arts uh, funding grant process. If artistry leaves the center, we would expect their portion of the cultural arts fund to be returned to the arts fund and redistributed through the current grant process. 
it's not only artistry that has been negatively impacted by COVID, but we have uh, been impacted as well, but we have survived and we could make good use of additional funds to pay staff and sustain our educational and artistic programs. Second, scheduling is done through the manager of the Center for the Arts, and generally artistry has been given precedence in the number of dates it is given for performances in the Schneider Theater. As a result, all of the other arts, arts organizations have had to limit their performance schedules. Mary, uh, I don't mean to interrupt you, but we are past our three minutes. I'm sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much, much for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> good evening. Um, my name is Kevin Tan. By way of full transparency, my wife is the general manager of the Bloomington Symphony Orchestra. But I'm here speaking tonight as the parent of a young woman who's in her 10th season studying with Continental, uh, Continental Ballet. Uh, we're former Bloomington residents, and we moved to Minnetonka about seven years ago. And while we could probably find a ballet studio to study with closer to home, uh, we continue to drive our daughter to Bloomington multiple times a week uh, to study at Continental. We do that because of the high quality instruction um, in classical ballet that she receives there, as well as the exceptional programming uh, that she's exposed to. We've also been impressed by and appreciated Continental's stewardship of their resources. Uh, I used to work in nonprofits. Every nonprofit goes through ups and downs, um, and certainly the pandemic was an extreme disruption to so many of our arts organizations. Throughout the good times and the challenging times, we've seen Continental constantly adapt to make sure they're always living within their means, as well as trying new things to stay solvent and fulfill their mission. Uh, so while it's up to all of you tonight to decide if artistry's request for um, for funding is a wise investment, and let me just state, I'm not against artistry. Uh, I hope they'll be successful. Uh, but I just want to reinforce what was um, previously stated, which is the notion that if artistry fails, the other arts organizations go with that is an incorrect um, assessment. And um, we really hope that uh, the organization, um, or we just want to reinforce that, Organizations like Continental have proven themselves to be good stewards of their resources, and fortunately, their sustainability is not reliant on whether artistry um, is able to affect a turnaround. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tan. Whoever up next, I hope you have the clipboard in hand. It's right here. It's, it's, it's over there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good, good, evening. E good evening. My name's Paul Smith. I'm the president of Larkin Hoffman. Um, and I'm here to support artistry in, in, in their request. Um, you know, Larkin Hoffman has been part of the Bloomington community for 60 years. We've been involved in endless developments, and many of our employees work, work and live in, in the community. And uh, for us, uh, from a very business perspective, having people like artistry is, is vitally important to our ability to at attract talent. Um, just having a, a competitive salary no longer uh, cuts it. Now we compete based upon what your community is like. Um, are your seats, are, are your streets safe? Uh, do you have a, 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 a vital arts community? And artistry is a, a perfect example of having a vital arts community. And we need that, especially when we're competing for talent with, with uh, Minneapolis now. Recently, we've had a couple of other things that have moved our, our way, um, but this is, not the, this is not the time to lose those things. And having a professional, award-winning uh, group like Artistry is simply an asset that the community doesn't want to lose. Um, you know, the uh, pandemic has been really problematic for theaters, museums, restaurants, uh, music venues. That group has been unevenly uh, impacted by uh, the pandemic, and, and it, it's, it's simply a loss for all of us because we need uh, those entities for our, our interaction, uh, to, to uh, teach us things we hadn't seen before, to, to simply add uh, um, life to our community. Um, and, and while I, I really appreciate the council doing, you know, looking at this uh, issue hard, I also am very cognizant of the fact that the, the business community needs to do the same thing. 
And uh, in that light, I, I'll be meeting with the uh, Bloomington uh, Chamber tomorrow, um, and my goal will be to uh, engage that group, strategize with that group, figure out how that group, the, the, the businesses of Bloomington, can, can come together and support uh, um, artistry, uh, keep them part of the community, and, and add you know, our weight to the effort that you folks are already making. So I appreciate you considering this, um, and thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good evening. Honorable Mayor, Bloomington City Council members, and fellow citizens, I am here today to share with you and our fellow citizens the story of how the Bloomington Center for the Arts yeah. came into existence. <laughs> Who was Alan, uh, Inez Greenberg, Alan Debbie Schneider, and Rose Schneider anyway? And why were the names on the theater, the art gallery, and the gift boutique? One could say that it all started with a pig. My New York dad went to the University of Iowa planning to be a vet and helping lots of nice animals, like dogs, cats, and horses. He discovered that castrating pigs was not his thing, so he transferred to the University of Wisconsin majoring in economics. After completing his degree, my father, James Greenberg, met and married my mother, Inez Leon Greenberg. Then my sister and I came along and we were exposed to a world of shows, museums, concerts, as well as travel, exhibits, or anything that looked like it might be interesting or fun. Moving on, I chose to attend the University of Wisconsin in Madison. It was there that I met my future husband, Alan Schneider. We married in 1951. After we completed our educations, we went to the Twin City area because our son David was on the way. We built a home in Bloomington, then came daughter Elaine. Both attended Bloomington schools where their excellent education served them well as they advanced their careers. All was well until a phone call that changed our lives forever. After 33 years of marriage, my mother, Inez Greenberg, was killed in a car accident. The flame of this vibrant, artistic redhead, so full of energy and fun, was extinguished forever. To honor her memory, we named the Center Art Gallery after her, the Inez Greenberg Gallery. I attended classes at the Art Center. It was very, it was in a Quonset hut, and everything was crowded. No, more space was needed. By that time, Al and I were doing well, and a big balloon in the stock market <clears throat> put us in a good financial position. We found ourselves with money to spare, and I suggested to Alan that we would give a significant gift to the city, but we'd better hurry because the stock market could drop and wipe out our entire gift. Not very long after the money was transferred to the city, the market took a dive. We came that close to losing it all. I called Susan Anderson, then the executive director, and uh, told her that we wanted to help found a new art center. She told me it was hopeless because the city required $1 million in order to have a referendum. Then I told her she did have the money, so have a referendum. And it was held, and the vote to pass the center passed. However, there were some problems. Ms. Schneider, I'm sorry. We're, I'm, I'm sorry, we're past your three-minute time limit, and okay. I, I, I apologize. We're trying to make sure everybody has the same amount of time. Thank you for your ongoing support. And You're welcome. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you for having us, Mr. Mayor, staff, council people. My name is Diane Dar. And uh, I have a unique name tag, which I think is the only one in existence. It says artistry, mother. And, and when I got that name tag, I thought, what an honor to be called the mother. How could that be? And I have four, four real kids, but I'm a history person 
with Bloomington, and we moved in in 56, and uh, that's a long time, probably before some of you guys were born. Uh, one of the things that I did when we were, when the kids were small was get involved with Bloomington Civic Theater, and I ended up getting on the board, and I loved being able to, and right away they said, because I had been in business before I became a mother, uh, I had business background, so I helped the theater with stuff and even got an award one year for that. In 1974, 75, the city of Bloomington asked me to be bicentennial chair, and we had an ob obligation to have a futures project from the bicentennial. Having been an art teacher in Bloomington schools and knowing other art teachers, we knew there was a need for arts in Bloomington. So I started the Bloomington Art Center in 1976. I still was interested in the theater, but at one point, those two organizations became together, and they had a new name, Artistry. And here we are in this building uh, that was a dream for a long time. How many more minutes do I have? Oh, I'm doing well. I, 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 I have so much to say, I didn't think I could do it with, uh, in three minutes. People that know me say, oh, you, you, you're full of stories. Uh, we moved into this building. I was here every day during construction. I found all kinds of mistakes that Clark Arlison and his crew were making, like filling in the floor of the pit in the orchestra on the stage saying, hey, that's not going to work. Uh, they had to rip it out. But anyway, we opened the first show in 2003. So I had a double interest. I cared about the visual arts, and I cared about the theater. And the fact that we were then working with the orchestra, the medalist band, Continental Ballet, uh, other arts groups, some of them have changed their name during the years we've been in here, was a wonderful thing. We were so unique. You guys, you don't realize there's nothing like this anywhere. Having it all together in one building, we can't let it go. We just have to do everything, and I want you to support option one and give us a chance. Thanks so much. Thank you, Diane. Well done. <laughs> Good evening. Hi, Mr. Mayor and council members. My name is Tyler Michaels King. I'm a local theater artist and the hopeful director of 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee at Artistry. Uh, I'd like to note that Artistry didn't ask me to be here. I came of my own accord uh, to speak as an artist. Uh, I sent a letter to the council yesterday sharing my history and advocacy uh, for Artistry. I hope you all had a chance to read it. I'm not going to regurgitate that letter, but um, I'd rather uh, speak my strong opposition to uh, option two and a possible outcome of option three, which is the roadhouse scenario for the theater. Uh, while a roadhouse scenario theater uh, may positively affect Bloomington's arts and culture programming, would still have performances for Bloomington residents and would continue revenue for the city, converting the arts center into a touring house would eliminate all future employment for local performers directors, choreographers, designers, and many technicians. Establishing a roadhouse means only artists from outside the community would receive employment. It would mean not one of the artists employed in BCTs or artistry's 60-year history would step foot on that stage unless they were a part of a touring production or came from out of town or another regional market. As I mentioned in my letter, artistry has always been a breeding ground for new talent here in the Twin Cities. So many people have started their careers at artistry and have, ha and have had storied careers at artistry. Generations of artists, countless people have gained both employment and skills by making theater here. Local artists. And many of those artists have gone on to incredible careers both locally and nationally. Option two, and a possible outcome of option three presented before the council today, a roadhouse scenario, would effectively disrupt a whole ecosystem of theater arts here in the Twin Cities. There is simply not another platform for artists like the one that artistry provides. Of course, I advocate for artistry and I want you to pick option one, but I ask that whatever decision you make tonight, that you make sure it includes local employment of local theater artists 
and the programming of local theater companies. Please do not take that away from this community. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like you're next. Looks to me like you're next. <laughs> Good Council evening. Mayor and staff, I'm Neil Peterson. Uh, we came to the Bloomington Civic Theater over 52 years ago when we lived in Richfield. And a year later, we moved to prestigious West Bloomington. We moved out into five acres. We had three little girls, a Great Dane dog, and a $25 pony. And we enjoyed that. And it wasn't too long after that when I was drug into running for city council. I came kicking and screaming, but I, I loved it. And I spent many years on the council, a number of years as mayor. I went on and served in the Metropolitan Council and then as a state representative. So for 25 years, we were in our house involved in Bloomington, and I have a different perspective. And I thought what I'd share with you tonight, that you've heard part of the story, but this facility that we're standing in is a but for. We tried to pass referendums for a new city hall, for a new police station. It went down in flames. Couldn't get it done. And then along came artistry wanting to do it. So the council at that time said, okay, do a referendum, but bring, bring a million dollars with you they did, and it happened. And the city said, oh my, it worked. So the city piggybacked on the referendum passed by artistry. They brought the money they had saved up for the police station, and they attached the city in between. So now we had a continuum. We had a continuum of public facility and public entertainment. And the woman who was mayor, a wonderful woman named Coral Hool, followed me as mayor. And one of her comments were, now people in Bloomington can come to City Hall because it will be positive and wonderful, not just for fines and mundane kinds of things or the police department. So we had this contagion going on. And the city's done a marvelous job of maintaining that connection. I'll share one more thing. I'm looking at my time. In all the votes that I took in public forums, the one I look back and regret the most were the no votes. Because no means negative. It's, it's a downer. Even when my kids would come as adults, I wanted to be yes. I wanted to have given them a positive. So I encourage you, vote for the positive. Don't vote no. No is a downer. It ends everything. Don't do that. That's my opinion. So please support this organization. We'll regret it if we don't have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council, uh, members, and staff. My name is Vicki Hukim. As a Bloomington resident and someone who specialized in nonprofit accounting for over 15 years, I would like to ask the City Council to decline the artistry, requ artistry request of $750,000. This started as a $350,000 ask, then quickly changed to $750,000, but then at the last meeting, the artistry representatives did not seem firm on that ask either. I believe that the, that the city should be requesting detailed expenditures of the $150,000 grant they've already requested, as that is in their obligations. I believe that artistry has put themselves in this position, and failures happened at many levels. I am not confident that this type of situation will not happen again, as it does not seem that there are policies in place to prevent it. As a nonprofit, there should, be an, there should have been policies and procedures put in place so such things as this do not happen. This is a mismanagement issue, and throwing money at it doesn't fix the problems. As an accountant now working in due diligence, I just can't say that this is a sound financial investment right now for the city. Yes, the $750,000 grant loan could save city, fund city funding if artistry succeeds, which there's no guarantee. City staff has now rec recommended this request becomes a grant. As they see, there is no payback to come back to the city as a loan for collateral. I believe they also realize the moment you allow this to become a loan, you open up a new president for the city 
allowing other nonprofit organizations within the community to come to the city for a loan. Um, I believe by doing this and approving this is a disrespect to the organizations that struggled and did everything that they could through the pandemic as well as those that had and were forced to shut down because they were never given the opportunity to come to the city for a loan or a grant. Also, while city staff recommended this change to a grant, I want to be clear that certain documentation should be provided in a grant proposal. In all the years that I've worked in nonprofit accounting, you are required to provide um, a detailed budget of how the said funds are going to be allocated. So if this request is to be turned into a grant request, I would expect that the city would mandate the budget, the detailed budget for this proposal as well. I completely support the arts. But as someone actively involved in the arts, it doesn't mean that I have or I should support the artistry situation in front of us tonight. I believe it would be in the best interest for the city to go with option three, noting that grant funding should still be available to our local resident art groups as they have maintained in the black throughout the pandemic and, de and they depend on the small funding grants that the city does provide. I truly believe that arts can remain successful in Bloomington, and I don't think the city needs to pay $110,000 for box office staff and software, as one organization has already stated. Um, there are many ways to make this a successful transition. We just need to work together with our resident art groups, as well as other art organizations within yeah. the city and surrounding area. Sorry. It goes fast, doesn't it? Yes. I know. I, know. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. And just one thing, I would like you to vote on the issue and not just passion and emotions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, City Council. Good uh, evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, two comments. One. Uh, if you could identify yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jeremy Ellerby. Um, I actually work for the Organization of Artistry. Um, on the issue of the funding, this is not the first time artistry has been here. If they are not able to make the promise, it won't happen again. And I think it was due to mismanagement. That's just a thing I am saying. Uh, that said, I have been the master electrician for artistry for the last five years. I have worked here not in a head role since we changed from BCT to artistry. I am also the master electrician for Penumbra Theater in St. Paul, and for previously of the Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis. Um, one of the things that artistry gives us is the chance for education. The electricians, the stagehands that work for artistry also work for Continental. They have also worked for others that have come. They have worked for rentals that come through. They work the concerts. We train them at artistry because that amount of time we get on stage gives us time to teach them. I like Continental, I love working for them, but it is two days, and I only got to do it f uh, twice a year for a couple of years. Uh, when we do the rentals, it is one day. We need the time to train people. We need it all over theater in the cities, but we need it here in Bloomington. We have young people who have come just now in the last couple of weeks, moved here home, either home from school or made this their home in Bloomington who want to work here, the ballet is not enough days for them to survive. The orchestra rentals are not enough days for them to stay in this industry. If we want them in this industry as a whole and we want them in our community, we need to make sure whether it is artistry or something else, that that work is here for them. And a roadhouse is not that. I have been a city employee for a year now. We are not ready. I have also worked at Bloomington. We are nowhere near ready to be a roadhouse. In three years, we will not be ready. And that cost is going to be huge. Thank you. Thank you. Others wishing to speak tonight? Come on up, sir. Good to see you again. But Gil Williams, uh, I, I think in... Gil, Gil, if I could ask you to come over to the microphone here. There or, you go. <laughs> the other to one. the left. The other one. Oh, the other one. There you go. <laughs> well, I need guidance and help. Thank you. Well, I, I, I can honestly say I'm the largest contributor financially to, to artistry. 
I've been told that. I believe in it. I just recently sent them $75,000. And I don't see why this, the city council should be asked to loan money. I think what should do, going back to the days of uh, Diane Darr and Andrea Speck, they reached out and asked people like me to give money. And I think that's what should happen. I don't think that the city should give a loan to artistry. I think that the per person in charge of artistry, like Andrea and Diane when she was there, should reach out and get people like me to give the money. And so why should the taxpayers fund it when I think there's money that, that people will donate because they believe in the, the function? So that's my comments. Thank you, Mr. Williams, as always. Thank you. So while others can contemplate whether or not to come forward, Matt, I know we have at least one person on the phone. Why don't we hear what they have to say, if we could. Yes, Mr. Mayor, we have, uh, looks like several folks have called in. I've got one person who has raised their hand. I'm going to unmute the caller with the phone number beginning with 952-843. Your line is now unmuted. Hello, uh, my name is Claire Fanning, and I am a local dancer and current company member of Continental Ballet. And I just wanted to call in and say I've been watching the meeting as it's been happening. Um, and I just wanted to say I want artistry to succeed. However, I feel like reading articles about artistry that funds were mismanaged in the past, and I want other local artists to have the opportunity to perform, but artistries, um, how they were not able to see, the pandemic is not an excuse for how they were not able to succeed because Continental Ballet was able to succeed and many other nonprofits were able to succeed and make it through the pandemic without being so negatively impacted that they had to shut down. Um, and I don't want artistry to fail, but other groups could also use this funding that they might get. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fanning. Appreciate it. Matt, are there others on the line who would like to speak? Yes, Mr. Mayor, we just had another caller raise their hand. I'm going to unmute the line of the caller uh, the phone number beginning with 952-564. Your line is unmuted. Good Again, evening. My name, is, my name is Sharon Billings, and I'm a resident of Bloomington. And thank you for allowing me to address you all tonight. Uh, I want to start by saying that you'd be hard-pressed to find a Bloomington resident who cares more deeply about promoting the arts in Bloomington than I do. Uh, the vibrant arts community has always been one of the things that I love most about Bloomington. And I'm so grateful that we have a beautiful and useful venue in Bloomington City Plaza that is the home for so many arts groups. Generally, I would advocate for any proposal that promotes or supports the arts in Bloomington. That said, the proposal that we have before us from Artistry does not appear to me to be a sound business venture when comparing the benefits and substantial financial risk. And so it's with a heavy heart that I must tell you that I would not support Artistry's proposal option one as it does not represent a sound business decision and I would advocate for option three. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate your comments. Matt, is there anyone else? Uh, Mr. Mayor, we have two other individuals on the line. However, they, they have not raised a hand to speak. We can check in with them quickly here. Anyone else in the chambers wishing to speak tonight? Caller with the phone number beginning with 952-843. Did you wish to speak on this item? Your line is unmuted. No, sorry, I already spoke. And then we have one more. And then caller with phone number beginning 612475. Your line is unmuted. Did you wish to speak on this item? No, I do not. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. 
Once again, last call for anybody here in the chambers who wish to speak. Seeing no one coming forward, Council, I am going to close our public comment opportunity on this item and turn it over to the Council for discussion. And as we have our discussion, Council, I'd remind you that uh, we're discussing among ourselves here. And uh, we, 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 heard from, from, we heard from the public, but uh, our discussion tonight is among the seven of us. So, um, Council, this is a tough one, and we've, uh, we've been talking about this for a few weeks now, and, and I know we've all received plenty of emails. I know there's been online and offline discussions regarding this. And uh, just my thoughts as, as we move forward, and then I'll make a suggestion where we might end up. Um, first of all, to, to some of the comments made, I, I am confident that our other resident art organizations will survive. I, I really am. I know that they're strong. I know if, if this doesn't go forward and if artistry wasn't there, the other resident art organizations would survive. Uh, they prov provide outstanding performances. They're well managed. I know they've got a lot of them are bursting at the seams in terms of uh, people participating. And so I have confidence in our, our other arts organizations. I also want to uh, point out, which you all know and which was alluded to earlier, that whatever we do with this, Bloomington supports arts and always has. Uh, with our, our Cultural Arts Fund, $180,000 each year, uh, the use of this, this fabulous facility, the, the city staff that, that works on it, 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 all, it all works together. And I think it, uh, it shows that Bloomington does have a commitment to arts, a variety of different arts. Um, I think sometimes when we think arts, we immediately think stage productions, but we all know that the arts go so much deeper, especially here in Bloomington with the different arts organizations that we do have. Uh, and to echo a lot of people who have also spoken tonight, I think it's a, it's a competition about who's the biggest art supporter in the city of Bloomington, and I'll add my name to that list as well. You've heard me talk many times. You've uh, heard me support the arts f with a full-throated enthusiasm, uh, sometimes in the face of folks who disagreed rather vehemently with me and uh, know full well that pre-pandemic, the arts in Bloomington showed a, a $12 million economic impact, and that, that cannot be denied, and it's, it's an important piece of this, but it also, uh, I think it's undeniable that it has changed, and uh, the pandemic changed the arts organizations across the Twin Cities and, and across, uh, across the country, across the world, and continue to change them. Uh, with all of that said as a precursor, Council, I just, I, I, I'm afraid I cannot support this $750,000 loan to, the, to artistry. Uh, for a couple of different reasons, the, the, and, and they're business-related items, most specifically. First of all, we heard from our friends at Artistry that 40% of their budget, they expect their, their upcoming budget model to be 40% supported by, by ticket revenues and 60% by outside revenues, which is a flip of what they had been doing in the past, 60% ticket revenues, 40% outside uh, revenues. And Council... I don't know of an arts organization that can survive on 40% ticket revenues alone and then relying on 60% external. There, there are some, I, I will grant you that, there are some, but uh, for example, we saw for years Penumbra struggle until they received a $2 million grant from the Bush Foundation and then all of a sudden they were, things were better. That, but just from ticket revenues alone, and a decreasing amount of ticket revenues, they're just not able to survive. And I don't know that artistry would be able to survive either. Uh, I think it's also telling that we have talked about at this council, and, and a number of folks have brought it up, the need for to, to see a business plan. What, what does this mean? How are we going to move forward? What is going to be the outcome? And it's important to realize that what we can expect, I think, if we approve this, is a development plan by this December and I think a, a business plan next December, December of 2023. And in my mind, that's just not tenable in terms of what we're gonna be able to manage in terms of an arts organization and, and uh, an investment of that kind that the city of Bloomington will, will make. There are other items as well we've talked about. I mean, this is not an insignificant amount of money, certainly. Uh, I think Council Member D'Alessandro brought it up. It's, uh, it's equal to actually a little bit greater than 1% of, us, of our levy, of a levy increase. Uh, we have uh, other things to consider, the, the equity of what our other fine arts organizations receive from the city and what they could then expect to receive if we would do this kind of thing. And uh, uh, I think more than anything, what it says just from a financial standpoint of, uh, uh, as we've talked about, in terms of 
what's, what's a priority for the city? I think we, we had this conversation, Council Member Coulter, about uh, is this, th this money would come from a, a, our strategic priorities fund. And the question is, is this our strate a strategic priority? And again, I would counter that the arts are a strategic priority in the city of Bloomington, and we contribute mightily to that strategic priority. But I just think this is above and beyond where we need to contribute or where we're able to contribute at this time. Council Member Martin. Thank you, Mayor. Did you have uh, other remarks or? No, I did not. Okay, I did not. Thank you very much. Um, and, and I'll, I'll echo. I've been uh, pretty floored by the stories that I've heard um, over the past week or so of how artistry has has touched people's lives and uplifted the community. Uh, and and I agree with that wholeheartedly. It is a, a tremendous asset. But uh, kind of along the lines you were speaking to, Mayor. Uh, so this $750,000 loan to begin repayment in 2024, from what I understand from the presentations, gets through the 2022 to 2023 season. During that time, we would leadership would be working to, in the document they provided, stabilize the financials, do a full program evaluation, including how to diversify and attract new audiences, which I think is something every arts organization in the country is trying to figure out right now. Uh, build a robust development plan, uh, and then engage in an organization-wide organization strategic planning process. And what I find frustrating about this whole experience, and not to speak on anybody's behalf, but probably a lot of us, is that that could absolutely happen. I bet those elements could come together at some point, but I very much doubt it's going to be by the end of the 2022 to 2023 season. And we would be right back here with a more fleshed out plan and another ask for 750 grand or whatever it, it would be at that point. So I, I think in terms of an investment of city resources, it has to succeed at that time or it's not a, it's not a loan, it's a gamble. Um, and I'm just not comfortable with the level of risk involved, especially considering it's taxpayer dollars. And, and I'll just say briefly because I had asked so many questions last time about turning this over to a, a venue management organization or kind of alluded to the roadhouse model, kind of on some additional reflection and looking at the estimated costs, I think just because something is so tremendously valuable for our community and beneficial for our residents, and arts and culture absolutely is, I am nervous to say it obligates the city to guarantee it's provided in the community. Uh, because I think there's an, an awful lot of things um, that have struggled a whole lot of areas of our community uh, that I just see some really dangerous mission creep if we get in the mode uh, of ensuring that things folks appreciate um, continue in, in their current forms. So, I, I would need to advocate for option three tonight, but I, I will say I very much appreciate everybody I've heard from on it. Council Member Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So first, I just want to say thank you to all the <laughs> residents who have emailed us, who have called us, who have um, taken the time to comment. Uh, a lot of a passion, a lot of love, um, and it can definitely be felt uh, for the arts in Bloomington. Uh, and like many of the people we've heard from, which I think is pretty much everybody, um, what, whatever side they're on in terms of supporting or not, I feel, I feel like everybody has expressed their sadness and their disappointment. So I think that that, and that's a good way to articulate how I feel. I also say that I personally, um, ever since we started this conversation, I've kind of tried to bring myself along and convince myself that yes, it's the right thing to do, but quite honestly, I've just gotten more and more angry. Like I've just gotten angrier that um, that this the burden of this decision and potentially artistry's fate has been put on our plates, even though it was not our failure in leadership. Um, and so I hope that um, for those who are listening, for those who have reached out, um, I mean, I know we're going to have residents angry and upset either way, no matter what decision we make. Um, and again, I just feel like... Um, it has been unfair to put the council in this position. Um, but with that, uh, a, a couple other comments I wanted to make. When I look at the term sheet, uh, the pandemic is mentioned as why the loan's being asked for, but I think it's exactly because of the pandemic that there should have been intense scrutiny on the financials of this organization. There should have been monthly finance committee meetings that were reviewing uh, the statement of activity. I don't know why that wasn't happening. I think there were, we recognize that there were many things going on uh, that led to that. Um, but it's because of the pandemic that there should have been more financial oversight. And so I, I can, there were red flags, and so I don't quite understand why it took so long to figure out why artistry was in this position. 
Uh, we have many, many wonderful nonprofits in Bloomington. I served on the board of Veep. If Veep was ever in trouble, I mean, if they come to the city, are we going to provide them a loan? If the other arts organizations, um, I think this has been mentioned, but I just don't think it's responsible for us to set that type of precedent. Um, and then I've also not seen the financial modeling that convinces me that artistry will be successful if given these dollars. And if it's not successful, the $750,000 will not be paid back because the artistry's assets are not great enough to provide that guarantee. So we are asking the residents of Bloomington, the taxpayers of Bloomington, to fund artistry at a total of about a million dollars this year then. Uh, and I just don't think, uh, I think that's too much risk for the taxpayers of Bloomington. Um, so again, I know that there are going to be many people who are upset with me um, for not supporting this loan, this decision. Um, but again, uh, I hope that those who have expressed um, their their interest in us approving this also understand that um, you know the responsibility and the accountability of financial oversight is the board of directors of artistry. And so, as the city council of Bloomington, our responsibility is to be. Um, judicious with the taxpayers' dollars of Bloomington, and, and that's why I'm making the decision that I'm making tonight. So again, I feel sad about the state of the organization, um, and if or artistry has to close its doors, it will be a loss, a, a true loss to our community. Um, but I also believe that people will rally, and, and an organization um, will come forward. And so with that, I will end my comments, um, but I will not be supporting the loan. Thank you, Councilmember Carter. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, nerd alert, as always, with me, right? Um, anybody else uh, feeling like they're in the middle of a Kobayashi Maru scenario? Um, I think I, I echo the sentiments of, of frustration that Councilmember Carter put uh, out there because I don't feel like this is the kind of choice that the City Council should ever be in the position to make, which is to act, to be asked to hold in its hands, you know, the potential survival or not of a nonprofit organization that is not bound to the city by anything other than goodwill, tradition, and joy. What a horrible thing to have to say to that, um, you know the Im immense amount of of joy and and valid, gorgeous, you know, work that the members of artistry have done over the years. Um, that that we are putting that up against um, a scenario that is just impossible to justify from a purely financial perspective. If I take the name artistry and I take all the tradition of artistry out, and I'm maybe a a lender at a bank and I'm sitting here looking at the information I have in front of me, there's not a chance in the world I would say yes to that loan. And I, and I think the reason that we're here tonight is because artistry leadership knows that and they're counting on, you know, the pulling on our heartstrings, valid as it is, to, to, to make decisions that are just not financially sound. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't put a percentage of our of our levy every year into the arts or anything like that. That's not the, the issue that's on the table. Uh, trust me, I wish that I could write a $75,000 check like Mr. Williams did. I, I would, right? I mean, and I wish 10 people like him did so then we wouldn't be here because they'd have their $750,000 and we, we wouldn't be burdening the taxpayers with this. I, I don't know how at the end of the day, um, we got here. I don't, I have not yet understood how it came to pass that the leadership of artistry thought to come to the city in the first place. Like, I, I don't actually know who kicked off the conversations. Um, but um, having said that, it, it, it probably really doesn't matter. Um, you know, we have to make, we've made really hard decisions over the last couple of years. I have, this is the hardest decision I've had to make sitting here, and I haven't been here that long. Uh, so um, I appreciate the opportunity uh, to to hear from so many residents. I did my personal account, and my, my own personal account to me directly, never mind the other comments we've heard tonight, is over 50 people, which is wonderful 
in its engagement. And I'd love to see that for every issue that we tackle up here. I'd love to see that. Um, but it's a testament to how truly amazing um, the arts is thought of in, in, in the city. And by the way, that $185,000, you know, I don't think that includes the creative placemaking dollars that we also include, right? So if you tack that on, we're getting close to half a million dollars every year that we work um, on to uh, on art stuff here, um, you know, over and above all the great work that our resident organizations do, right? Um, the one thing I will say is that I really hope that no matter what the outcome is tonight, and I will be clear, I, I, I won't support the loan tonight, um, that, that we find, whether it's through the Fine Arts Council, the, you know, the, the other organizations in the metro area and everything to, to make sure that it's not, um, it's not very long that you know, our performing arts centers are, is dark, if that's what happens, because Bloomington needs the arts, and they said it over and over again, both by their attendance and their enthusiasm tonight, and their um, and the the information that we've been getting over the years. Um, so, uh, I think I'll end with that, and I um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to have this discussion, and um, I hope to never be put in this kind of position again. <laughs> thank you. Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Nelson. Councilmember Coulter. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Well, I've been at this five years now and I think I can count noses as, as well as anybody. So I think I know where we're headed and um, I do wanna make a few comments and I'm gonna, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna try not to get, I was gonna say I'm gonna try not to get emotional, well, perhaps the better phrase is that I'm gonna try not to get too emotional. Um, I think we need to be clear about what we're talking about here. And I certainly respect folks who say that this shouldn't be the city's role, that this is not the policy choice that we wanted to make. And you know, I, I respect that, I really do. I, I think it is fair to, to ask the question, but the reality is being elected officials, we are called upon to make the difficult decisions. And we are here today, yes, because this was the avenue that was available. And because for a variety of reasons, most specifically timing, there, is, there was just not another option available to, to artistry's leadership. Um, but I think we need to be clear that what we are talking about here tonight is in all likelihood, the end of artistry. And I say that not only for the financial reasons, but let's be clear, even if the current artistry leadership is somehow before they run dry, able to approach a bank, they will be doing so with a negative vote of the city council of the city in which artistry is located. And maybe they wouldn't have gotten approved to begin with. I, you know, there are others, admittedly, mine is not a business mind. That's not my background. It's not my area of experience. I, I get that. Maybe they wouldn't have gotten approved without it, but they will have that in addition to everything else. And I think what we have heard tonight and over the past few weeks, and admittedly, there is, there is not unanimity, as there never is, but there is support from the community. There is support from residents. There is support from businesses. I don't know if I've ever seen the president of Larkin Hoffman, one of the oldest, most established businesses in the city of Bloomington, come and advocate to us for anything. And he advocated for this. And there is support from the arts community. Someone said tonight, there is not another platform like artistry. And, you know, with option two or option three, maybe we can get a sustainable roadhouse type model that can work. I, I mean, with another one just south of the river and another one literally in this city at the Masonic Home, I'm extremely skeptical that that's gonna happen and to say nothing of happen any time in the next couple of years. I think, you know, nobody's really mentioned it. I don't think anybody thinks option two just based on the expense is, is really worth pursuing. But again, as we have heard from folks who know and I am certainly not gonna excuse 
artistry, former artistry leadership or any member of the board, myself included. But we have heard folks in the industry say that if we were to switch to a roadhouse model, it will not be local employment. It's not going to be the folks who support our local economy. It's not going to be the folks who shop here in Bloomington, who eat here in Bloomington. It's going to be folks from touring companies or other cities. And both of those options would require this essentially the city to put together a new organization that, as I said, I am just extremely skeptical is going to easily get off the ground. And I think it is unnecessary for us to do that when we have the experience, when we have the dedication from the staff that has been working these last few weeks to make this work. And I do believe they can, it can work. I get that it is a, a not insignificant investment of public dollars. And, and that has weighed on my mind as well. As I, as I mentioned, literally my own family members have talked to me about this. It comes from a fund that at the end of next year will still have a positive balance of $4.6 million. It, it is not an insignificant investment. I'm not saying otherwise, but it's not going to break the bank. And I, I, in the conversation that I've had, and I've had a lot of conversations with the new leadership, what this funding will allow them to do is to get that runway to build the organization back, to do those things that we all believe they should do. So, I mean, as I said, I, I have a sense of where this is all going. I, am, I just wanna say again that I am, I am extremely disappointed that this is, this is the result of this. And, you know, again, I would rather we not have to make this choice either, but we're the ones that are faced with the choice. And I, I am just extremely disappointed that this is the choice we're making. Whatever option, and I, 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 as I said, I'm, it's pretty clear there is not the support for option one, so I'm not going to attempt to move forward with that. Whatever option we do pursue, it needs to be based in the community. It needs to get buy-in from the local folks, the folks who know what it's like on the ground, so that we can build something that supports the local community. I'm disappointed that we aren't able to build on something that already does that, but we are where we are. So however we move forward tonight, please keep it focused on the local community. Councilmember Nelson. Did you want to go? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll, I'll be very brief here because I think we all know where this is going and, and uh, it uh, takes five votes to pass it and I, that's not there. So. Um, in my mind, I, I agree with my colleagues regarding the business decision. This would be, a, if I was a bank, I absolutely would not make this loan based on the information I have, based on what I see. In my mind, though, it's not a business decision. That's not why we're up here. This is a community amenity decision, and um, I, I don't believe that not passing this means you don't support the arts. I'm not saying that at all. Um, I think the question more in my mind, is this the best way pa forward for theater in particular, for uh, visual arts, for the creative placemaking, for those things that artistry does? Is this the best way forward? And we're talking about developing a business plan and a development plan over the course of years at the cost of $750,000. I gotta think we can get that done for less money uh, than that. We can still put together the, this probably to Council Member Coulter's point means the end of artistry. It does not mean the end of theater. It does not mean the end of visual arts. It does not mean the end of those things. Um, to, um, uh, to Paul from Larkin Hoffman meeting with the chamber tomorrow. We absolutely need to come together with the business community. We need to come together with the donor community. We need to come together as a community and figure out the right path forward. And I truly believe we can do that for less than $750,000. I truly believe we can get somewhere that is really good for this community. We've got so many people passionate about arts in this community. We have such a great venue and opportunity here. We just need a reboot. You know, what happened here didn't work. We need a reboot, we need to start that over, we need to work together, and the city absolutely has to play a role. And I believe that when there is a plan in place and if there is funding needed with a good, strong plan, that this city will stand there and be prepared to support that. Um, and 
that's where we need to go in my mind. That's the direction to go. And I agree with my other colleagues and some of the speakers here. I think the roadhouse idea, although I've talked to the city manager about it before, I don't think that's the right way to go. You know, I commented last time about community theater, and that is absolutely, I think, one of the most vital things that is special about what artistry has done, is providing those opportunities for artists, for those people in the community that, that want to um, get that part of their creative nature out there. We need to provide that opportunity here in Bloomington. It's such an important thing, and so I absolutely would not support going that direction, and I would support if there is a request or a process or a plan where we need to invest in strategic planning and bring those together that we could play that role. I know, Mayor, you talk a lot about alignment. How do we work as a council, as a city, to bring that alignment around this and fix this going forward? That, that's, that's what I'd ask us to do, and I think that's uh, some of what I heard from Councilmember Coulter as well as, you know, he saw a platform there, but I think that ultimately, from what I'm hearing, that's what to driving all of us, everyone who spoke tonight, believes in the arts, and, and thank you. Let's let's get this done. Let's let's figure out a good path forward. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Loman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> uh, every morning, and uh, actually over the pandemic, uh, I had uh, put up uh, in my office uh, at home uh, painting that my um, my sister-in-law's uh, aunt had uh, had had done. So it's a painting of the Center for the Arts as you kind of walk in, and so I'm kind of reminded of that. And it's it's a reminder to myself uh, the role that arts has played uh, in uh, my life. And um, certainly, there is a great deal of history uh, here within uh, this building uh, and within the community as it relates. We heard that uh, this evening. Uh, and there's going to be a future of, of those arts as, as we look forward. In 2015, uh, uh, a different council uh, sat here and uh, heard many of the things uh, uh, that were brought forward by um, artistry. Um, and what it all amounted to was about $1.5 million uh, worth of uh, either loans or grants. Uh, that were provided uh, to artistry um, at that time. Over a month ago, I had asked uh, artistry to, uh, to go back after their original um, request and look through uh, what made sense and to bring forward to this body a realistic number uh, by which that they would be able to uh, put together a business plan and a reasonable time frame by which to do uh, that that time frame, uh, Mayor. Uh, I think they brought that back. They upped the amount quite a bit more than I thought they would, but they did. They brought it back. They gave a time frame uh, for both the development plan uh, and a business plan. Um, I was disappointed with how it looked, but I, I understand that you know it's a volunteer organization and they're rushing to get these uh, items done. Um, and so I looked at that and was like, okay, we're, we're making some uh, uh, suggestions. The, the problem I have with the decision that, that we're, we're making tonight is I think the time to unwind this organization would have been back uh, when they were asking for the $150,000 um, uh, to go to artistry. I think that was the moment in which that we should have unwound this, this thing. We've already put uh, that amount of money into it, and we've also invested over – uh, 1.5 million plus uh, into artistry, all the history that's there, uh, that's part of that. I wish that um, the leadership of artistry would have uh, learned from its first uh, financial uh, meltdown. I know that we on, on council uh, did that with the fire pension. We ran into an issue back in 2008, fire pension. We created a... a uh, a rainy day fund uh, to, to be able to, to weather that. Uh, we, we've had other examples uh, that I could cite, and I won't uh, spend the time because obviously I can see uh, where uh, this is going uh, this evening. Um, and certainly, I, I, I have I've been angry about the inability of artistry to be able to plan ahead, uh, and the you know the liability that you know they first put us in back in 2015, and then again today. But I look at uh, artistry uh, differently than I do other um, arts uh, 
organizations that are within the city. I look at uh, artistry as being more of an arm of economic development. And by terminating that economic development plan today, even though they don't have it together again today, uh, I, I just think that that is a rather large loss. I, I understand, Mayor, uh, what you mean, uh, and I, I totally agree. The, the model by which that they uh, put together, uh, that they were bringing forward in there, uh, advocating for the 40% supported tax tickets and the 60% of external model, if you look out there in the arts community, that just doesn't work. And that's what I was really hoping uh, to get a chance to see uh, with giving them a little more time frame to, uh, to, to roll that out. Uh, and so I've actually come around uh, to seeing things a little bit differently uh, than how my colleagues see this. And what I would say, uh, you know, try to, to try to wrap this up, is when you look at the other options that are available uh, for us to go down. If we, we take the third option, that really does not give us a development uh, or economic development uh, arm with the, the, the length of history um, or the prestige that artistry has. Nor if you look at the secondary uh, option that does shut down the, the possibility of having uh, local uh, uh, engagement within the process and it's essentially cost us more than the amount of money that we would be investing in this particular proposal. And I think that what we're gonna find is, it's sort of like the stadium effect, uh, you know, with the, the Twins or the, the Vikings or that kind of thing. You know, once the, 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 the entity has left the town to get it to come back at this level is going to be extremely difficult to do and to be able to replicate. And so while I cringe, and I continue to cringe uh, at that number, and, uh, and, and <laughs> I've said it before, uh, I, I just think it, you know, the, that that price is high to be able to do that. But I think that when we uh, look at this later down the line, we're going to find that, that this is what we're going to need to, to do something to this degree. It's going to cost us this and more uh, to, to be able to, to get this type of economic development uh, within uh, the city. And I think, Mayor, you know, <laughs> you're absolutely right. If we look back to the development uh, or to our discussion that we had uh, in terms of strategic priorities, this really does not fit into that. Although, unfortunately, sometimes emergencies uh, you know, present themselves and you need to take uh, a chance to do it. So I would, uh, you know, I, I, again, I would look to my colleagues and say that, you know, I, I can understand why you wouldn't want to do this tonight, but I don't, I don't, I think saying no to this precipitates the necessity for us to figure out what is that next step. And I think if you look at the two options that were laid out by staff, and this is one of the reasons why I voted no uh, uh, last meeting, is I didn't think we had enough time to viably come up with options that I think are workable. And so uh, these two options that are presented before us today, I cannot support and I will not support because I do not believe that they're in the fiduciary responsibility uh, of this body to be able to move forward. And, and certainly, maybe this, this first plan uh, is not either. Uh, but I don't, I don't like what I see here, and I just I, I can't support that, uh, those two uh, options, two and option three moving forward. So um, I, I honestly think we ought to <laughs> look at something else here. Uh, so uh, barring no other economically viable option, I will be tonight supporting uh, this, this first option uh, that's here, uh, understanding the concerns, uh, but um, I'm, I'm going to support this. Uh, I, I think that uh, we need to think about this as we're moving forward, and th there is a level that we're going to need to, if we're going to have this type of economic development, we're going to need to support it ongoing. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, and I want to see somebody who's got that level of experience uh, do that work. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Council, with uh, all that we've heard and everybody having an opportunity to chime in here, I'm going to move that we decline the funding request. We go with option three as outlined by staff and direct staff to do an analysis of how to move forward in the future. Do we have a second? 
Mr. Mayor, do we need to make a second before the discussion? Because if, if, I had if, some if, questions about some if, of the other comments. If we make the second, then we then we move on to discussion. Okay, second. We have a motion and a second. So, questions or comments? I saw Councilmember Carter and then um, Councilmember D'Alessandro, Councilmember. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, some of the comments made this evening make me feel a little bit more optimistic, and I am an optimistic person, so... Um, but, you know, Mr. Williams talking about the fact that people need to be asked, um, the conversations with chambers, it sounds like there are still a lot of conversations happening. And um, and so I know that um, when the city manager kind of set up the conversations, this is all assuming that artistry ceases to exist. But I also feel like it's helpful for us to assume that artistry will continue. Um, it just may be at a smaller scale or it just may look a little different. And so... I also kind of as part of this um, motion, I guess I would hope that ongoing support, non-financial support of artistry through the ex officio roles and just helping to support them in their conversations to get grants and other um, financial opportunities that we would still be supportive. And I think that that's also what Council Member Nelson was saying. Council Member D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I agree with that. Um, when we first brought the, when this first came to council, one of the questions that I asked was, why do we have to ha have this money up front? Why can't we have this commitment made over time with performance metrics in place as as measured by the um, by the the accountability of the organization? So, for example, and I'm. I hope I'm going to get this math right. If we did 350, then 250, then 250 over three subsequent years with performance metrics there, we wouldn't be putting the same amount of money at risk and we would get the information that we needed in front of, uh, in front of us before we would make a commitment. In other words, it would, be, um, it would be the same commitment out of the same fund, but with positions in place that we could withdraw that support if they don't meet their targets. And one of the none of the pre presentations tonight includes that option. And I'm just curious as to whether or not we even considered it and if that could be an alternative to what we have in front of us tonight. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro. I think the reason that you don't see it among the options is it's not something that uh, artistry has responded positively to as an option. They asked for the $350,000, they asked for 500000 originally. Council granted 150 uh, and said, come back uh, and we'll talk about the 350. And when they came back, they said the 750 is the right number. Um, they have not uh, proffered the um, possibility that 350, 250, 250 is workable for them. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but my understanding is that 350 doesn't guarantee their success. 750, uh, in their eyes, is much more likely to assure their stability that they'll be able to build from. And I think that uh, they don't have that same level of confidence for 350. From the council's perspective, whether you would do that, um, seems to me to be um, perhaps even riskier than the 750 in that if if artistry is not confident that 350 is the right number, um, granting them that additional money on top of the 150 seems to be um, a, a less good choice than um, considering the 750 is my interpretation. And I don't know, Mr. Mayor, if you want to invite Mr. Milan or anybody else from Artistry to uh, confirm that because I, I don't want to be speaking on their behalf. Mr. Milan, any thoughts on it? or and, and no thank you as an answer as well, if you'd rather not comment to that. Pat Milan, president of the board of artistry. Thank you for seeing too much of me. Um, I think Jamie really has it right. You asked us and we looked you in the eye and you specifically asked, what will it take to be successful? And when we came in here with the earlier number, we thought 500 was it, but we had more time to look at the financials. 750 is the number we need over the next six months. Do we need 750 today? The answer is no. But we will need some combination of something close to that in by fourth quarter that we're in 
and first quarter next year. Otherwise, it's an exercise in emergency management all the time. We can't get out of that mode long enough to go get the other funding. So that uh, we're confident in the 4060 model because that's the model that most theaters do operate on. But we do need some time to be able to build that out. So uh, do we need 750 today? The answer is no. We probably need closer to 350 because you've heard what our monthly operating is. But we would, we would need to figure something out by first quarter. That, that is the point. So I hope that cl helps clarify it. It does. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Who is next? Councilmember Coulter or Councilmember Carter? Councilmember Carter. I've lost track. Councilmember Coulter. I, I wasn't sure if Councilmember D'Alessandro was finished. I wonder if she had. Um, no, no. I, I mean, I. Um, if if the way if if everybody up here feels the same way that city manager does that um, that you know there isn't an, a, a viable option for us to consider cadences on this as opposed to upfront, then I don't have any other comment. So you guys can tell me. Thank you, Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I don't have anything more to say other than um, one thought that occurred to me over the recent weeks is that um, we have put forward a, a request it, and we'll discuss our legislative priorities in, in the next couple of months um, for a center through for the arts expansion. Um, I think, I mean, I said it before and I will say it again, I think likely tonight means the end of artistry as we know it. Um, and I think that would certainly factor into whether or not we would approve that Center for the Arts expansion as a as a legislative request. And I um, just want to make sure that staff is is preparing for that, and that we as a council are preparing for that discussion as well. Councilmember Loman, you know I would be open to you know because some of my concerns would be um, uh, Blade, uh, you know, because we don't really have any financials at all. Uh, so I, I don't agree with the city manager uh, with regards to uh, rolling this out uh, in, in, a, in a you know a staged uh, kind of process. And of course, we'd have to work through the details. Um, again, impossible to, to kind of do that with the short time frame that we've had. Um, uh, and having we would need to have more conversations uh, uh, between the city manager. But I, I think there's something that could be worked out with that. Certainly, I could I could support that. I certainly could support that much more than I could support options number two and options number three here. I just don't. I don't see how these things are uh, are viable long term. I think we'll find ourselves right back here again, and we're going to spend a lot more than the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars here uh, that's uh, proposed for us. And I believe that we're going to, you know, since this is being arranged as a loan, uh, we'd get it back. So uh, I would be open to, to to have a conversation. I don't know that we could do that tonight. Um, uh, I think they'd have to come back um, and uh, have some, you know, a realistic conversation about that. Also, the motion on the table is to reject the funding request to uh, accept option three as presented by staff and direct staff to do an analysis and bring options back or bring uh, a path forward back uh, within what would be reasonable, 60, 90 days or longer than that? Yeah, Mr. Mayor and Council members, if that's the direction, I think we'd probably want a little bit more time okay. just because I don't know that we could put together a viable model or even you know, have a full understanding of what's out there in that much time. Okay. So, thank you. So we'd be looking at Q2 or 3 of next year probably sometime. So council, we've got a motion and a second on the table. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Let's make this about motion. Aye. Opposed? I uh, I'll restate the motion one more time. Uh to reject the funding request, to uh, accept item, option three as outlined by staff, and to direct staff to uh, bring back a, an analysis and a path forward by quarter two or three of next year. Councilmember Nelson. Yeah. Sorry, Mary. Um, do we, does this authorize any of that funding? There was talk of 110000 for software and salary and things like that, because I would not be comfortable with that. I think similar to Councilmember Lowman's concerns, um, I don't really support what's in that third option other than, you know, it, it doesn't seem like 
the first option is the most viable path forward, I would be somewhat interested in a potential alternative uh, that uh, Councilmember D'Alessandro had talked about, but I, I'm not comfortable authorizing any funding for staff and or um, software or anything like that without knowing the path. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Council Member Nelson, the essential thing in the scenario we're talking about, and again, this assumes that artistry ceases operations, right? And that's for the purpose of discussion. I, I don't want to represent what their decision may be coming out of the council's decision tonight. If they cease operations, what's really important is to maintain a box office operation because we have the other resident arts organizations that are still um, performing and utilizing the center. And for the city, it's important that we maintain a box office operation. And um, if, if that ends up being the case, um, we, we want to make sure that we have that function. That's, that's what it's saying. Point of clarification there, Mr. Yeah. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we did hear, hear earlier today that the Continental Ballet does not leverage that service. That's Can correct. you describe the residents? Uh, how, how many of the residents' arts organizations do utilize that service? Um, my recollection is that it is all except for um, Continental Ballet and perhaps the um, uh, BSO. I see that Sarah Tan is here. Is BSO using the box office? It does. Yeah. yeah. So I believe Continental is the only one that does it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. They don't need you. <laughs> does, does that help clarify? It, I guess uh, I'm not. I'm still not comfortable authorizing that moving forward, given that there may be other viable options without, you know, knowing what those are and if they are truly viable. I mean, we heard public comment that um, that it could be done a different way at substantially less expense. I so, I would suggest, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Nelson, that um, maybe the the better um, course here is just to decline the request and then uh, once we know what is going to happen happen subsequently a staff will come back and have a policy discussion with the council if that's the motion the council wants to pursue the, yeah I got more if I can sorry, council sorry Member Nelson thank you um, just trying to follow the rules here yes I'll jump in uh, the um, <laughs> the only thing that I would want to make sure that we have in there is just the direction to staff to work on that plan, how we make sure that uh, we have theater, visual arts, all of those things in our community and thriving going forward, including working with uh, you know the people that are currently at artistry, the business community, all of that stuff, which I think was part of that. It was just the the other part that I wasn't comfortable with. So, very good. So I, st I still want to make sure we give that direction. Sounds, sounds good. Councilmember Carter. Um, thank you. So if we decline tonight, I also do hear potentially a willingness to entertain the more phased approach to funding with deliverables. Um, so if artistry folks decided to, could they come back to city staff and say, we would like to put in a proposal for a more phased request, if that works for them? Does that make sense? Uh, so what you're suggesting, Council Member Carter, if I'm, I'm, tell me if I'm wrong here, is that if we, if we simply scale it back to a declining the request this evening, and eliminate the other two pieces that I had put on there. And then if artistry came back with within two weeks or a month or whatever and had another different request that was phased over a couple of months, that that would, uh, is that what you're suggesting? Right, so they could still, they could decide to do that if they wanted to. I, I imagine they could, I think. I mean, we just heard from the board chair that that isn't optimal for them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I don't think there's anything preventing that, yes. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. If, if, if that's the direction this body wants to go with, I, I understand it. But I also want to make sure that we're not shooting for the outcome that would make us all feel the best and the community feel the best, because I don't want to keep dangling a carrot out in front of this organization and the volunteers and the donors and the staff to just drag out what may end up being the inevitable. I and mean, we've got all kinds of documentation saying we need this for six months. We've got a lot of long-term plans, and it's kind of a question mark in between there. So I just want to be careful about the expectations we're setting up here, and I like the word, the new wording that we've got on three. Councilmember D'Alessandro. I thank you, Mayor. I appreciate that comment, and, and the only argument that I would make on the other side of that would be that um, I think one of the positive benefits of this conversation is that it it 
brought to the attention of the public a, an important problem in our arts community. And I don't want to close the door to a beneficial scenario like artistry coming back two weeks from now or three weeks from now and saying those donors that we were going to hit, they showed up. And now that number doesn't have to be $750,000 because the Gil Williams of the world made good. And I don't want to close the door on that is all I'm getting to. And I, I, I'm a, I don't want to be in a situation where, where we've basically shut them out permanently if they can go find, you know, that great conversation tomorrow with the chamber, you know, and other things like that unearths opportunity that, um, in fact, I was hoping that that might have happened and we would have been surprised today that, you know, some big donor came in with a $250,000 check and we were able to go, woohoo, you know. Um, so I, I'm trying to be optimistic to say that there are really smart, capable, good people in artistry who should should hope are going to continue to try to fight to do the right thing. And I didn't want the door to shut on their ability to come back if that was something that we could do. So I don't want to put words in everybody's mouths here, but that, that was what we were hoping we weren't going to, um, you know, we weren't going to shut that door. So Make if sense? I offered a, an amended motion that simply tonight said to decline the funding request this evening with none of the other pieces attached, which then would leave the door open if, you know, if an angel landed on somebody's doorstep and, and the artistry was able to, to come back to the council with a, with a different possible funding model, that that would, would be possible. So I, if, I made, if I made that amended motion to simply remove the two qualifiers and simply say we reject the funding request this evening, uh, who, seg who, who seconded it? Would you, would, would you find that revised motion you, amended? Yes, Mr. Mayor, it, it, as it's lit, lit, written on our sheet, actually it just says, not to provide the requested assistance, period. It doesn't okay. have anything else. If that's what you're proposing, then I will second that. You took the words right out of my mouth. That was, uh, I would move, or I would bring forward a revised motion to not provide the requested assistance. Second. And we have a, a, a second, the seconder is amenable to that as well. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mary. And I know I've, I've talked a lot more even than I said I would, which is, you know, not unusual for me, I suppose. But um, just, by way of sort of clarification, we do not have a meeting next Monday. We also don't have a meeting the following Monday. So the next meeting we would be looking at, I believe, is November 14th. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think, you know, artistry made it clear that, that any kind of funding would need, be needed in this quarter. Um, as we get to mid to late November, we are rapidly running out of time in this quarter. So um, I... If, if some, something like that is, is able, able to be achieved, fantastic. Um, but I'm extremely skeptical that that's going to be the case. And I think, as Councilmember Lohman said, I, I don't see the other options as, as <laughs> any more financially viable uh, for the city's time and investment than, than the first one. So um, I, will, I will still not be supporting that motion. Council, I'm going to call the question here and uh, see if we can get a vote on this. Second. So the, the motion is to not provide the requested assistance. The motion in the second is to not provide the requested assistance. Are there any questions on that? No questions? No further discussion. I'll counsel. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 5-2 with Coulter and Lohman in opposition. Thank you. And to all the folks who are here with us this evening, thank you for your support. Thank you for your conversation. Thank you for your input. Um, this was, uh, I think as everybody said, this was not an easy vote. This was not an easy discussion. And uh, appreciate your input and, and your passion for this in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Next up on our agenda is item 5.2. It is uh, the first of uh, four... 2023 budget discussions we're going to have. The first one, item 5.2, will be regarding the Information Technology Fund budget. And Kari, why don't you walk nice and slow up there, let uh, folks sort themselves out a little bit here.
Folks, thank you all for coming. If you could take your discussions out into the lobby, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Understood. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Good evening, Ms. Carlson. Good evening, Mayor. And I'll let everybody know I, I threatened, I, I, or I, I joked with Kari that when this came up, I was going to move for adjournment just to have all the staff once again <laughs> <laughs> wish for my death once again. So, uh, Thanks, Kari. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, also um, on the line is Amy Cheney, the Chief Information Officer. She's going to take you uh, through most of this presentation, but I'll just start off by saying this is the first internal service fund that we've talked about this year. Um, and there's eight internal service funds. IT is uh, one of them that the department is in its own internal service fund. So those are the funds that they charge out to different departments that use their services. And then they use those funds to pay for the items and the services that they provide. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Amy and have her take you through a department overview. Good evening, Ms. Cheney, welcome. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you for having me. Um, as Kari said, I am the Chief Information Officer and uh, IT supports internal uh, city departments. Uh, we have well over 800 users that we support and externally we have the opportunity to support um, things like the Farmer's Market, Bloomington Ice Garden. Uh, we support the Art Center groups. Uh, we support their technology. And then also we have our public health clients. So those are just some examples of our external clients. But of course, um, by supporting our internal clients, we are supporting all of the city. Next slide, please. So just a quick look at our revenues and um, how we get our charges. We are an internal service fund and um, we charge approximately $10,000 per year per employee, which includes all the techn technical services as well as um, software fees, um, all of the equipment that our end users use um, is all included in that $10,000 per year. Next slide. Um, looking at our operating expenses, much like any other city department, we have uh, personnel costs, material supplies and services. Um, we also pay internal service charges um, for insurance, facilities. Um, a large portion of our budget goes towards the software maintenance fees, and I'll take a look at that in the next slide. Um, and then also we have new, new software purchases um, pretty much on an annual basis. Um, under capital, we have our uh, computer hardware, fiber optics, servers, um, all of the equipment that we need to run the, the department. Next. Looking at some of the um, buckets of our expenses, um, this chart shows that our personnel costs and our software and hardware maintenance are almost equal, which is uh, not typical for any of the other departments to have um, one of our expenses to be uh, equal to our personnel costs. Um, most of that software and hardware maintenance is software, and it's about twenty or $2.5 million a year. Uh, some of that is hosted uh, by the city and others is hosted in the cloud. We have over 150 ap applications to support our departments. Next slide. Just taking a little peek at the future, um, we were fortunate enough to receive some funding through the ARPA um, funding uh, for our to expand our fiber optics network, and that will impact directly our traffic unit, utilities, parks and rec, and public safety. Um, we have $250,000 budgeted for 2023 and 405,000 for 2024. We expect to begin construction as early as spring of 2023. Next, next slide. Uh, another glimpse at the future. So currently we have a uh, 19 full-time and one part-time staff. Uh, we, uh, we will be requesting some new positions in the future. 
uh, to support the many end users and the new technology. Uh, one would be a desktop support specialist in 2024, and then a business analyst, which will really help our departments look at their business processes before we update or replace technology. So we're looking at that for 2025. Um, and then just keeping an eye on um, the needs for data analytics, security, and GIS. Uh, those are uh, three areas that are ever evolving and we wanna make sure that we have resources available to support those for the city. And I believe Kari is gonna take us through the next slide. Yes, and uh, one thing I will add is that um, during the year, there were two employees that were in public works uh, they were, that did work with GIS, and um, now they've shifted over to IT to have all of GIS within the IT department. So um, that is now reflected in the IT budget. And so this is the long-term model. Um, for the Information Technology Fund. So we've got um, years shown here, the past three years, or past two years, 2020, 2021, and our estimate for 22. Then we've got our 23 budget request and conceptual request for 24, and then a couple years projected out. Um, so for 23, the budget of re revenues, that's uh, 7.3 million. So those are the internal charges to other departments that we've been talking about. And then the budget ex expenses for 23 are around $8 million. Um, that blue line that is in the revenue section as, is just, again, highlighting in all these models. If we have any American Rescue Plan funds, we just want to show you where those are being, um, where those are coming in. So those are going to be used in the IT projects that Amy was describing. And then um, the working capital balance, it is positive. So the you know, base, what we're talking about with the working capital, again, is basically the cash, the short-term um, assets that are available for spending. And um, it does remain significantly lower than we would like it. You can see um, in the red, once it um, goes below 70%, it goes into the red, and it's going as low as 31%. So it's definitely feeling a lot of pressure um, from keeping the... For a few uh, years, we kept the internal charges to other departments lower for a lot of the internal service funds, including IT, to keep the pressure off the general fund and the property tax levy. But over time, that does um, negatively impact them. Um, and we, in the past, haven't been charging probably as much as we should for IT um, to the other funds. We've, um, we've brought in some transfers from other funds in the past to kind of help shore it up. Um, but it is something that we're looking at closely and kind of the goal, um, how we structured for this budget and our projection is to keep them from being negative. But it is something that, um, it is an issue for this fund. And that is all we have for the IT fund. Do you have any questions for me or for Amy Janey? Yeah, thank you. Uh so as I look at this here, the, the, the top line, the charges to departments, the, the technology charge, I mean, it's, it's laid out, as you described, it's a charge from another department, but it's got to be funded from something, and so it obviously is a, is a cost overall. And from 2022 to 2026, it goes up by $2.5 million. And you may have kind of talked through it a bit, but as I look through some of the, the total expenses, I'm seeing... You know, salaries and benefits up by seven million, and some of the others. But I, I don't necessarily see that that's significant of a jump in terms of the 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 charges to departments in the in the uh, in the expenses. Is that making sense? Yes. So, Mayor and City Council members, I can kind of walk you through what we're estimating for this long term model. So, we're estimating to to spend down working capital balance by $1.3 million this year. Um, and then we have a little bit of a, if, if you see, um, and then 23, we're still um, going to be spending down 700,000. It's getting, we're bringing it down so that our expenses are more than our revenue in those years. And so 
if we don't have those charges the way they're projected right now at that level, the cash is going to go negative for the fund. I don't know if that makes sense. So are the is the use of the American Rescue Plan, is that kind of exacerbating a, a structural imbalance there? Is that what I'm understanding or not? Um, Mayor and City Council members, no, the projects that we have in there, it is also reflecting in the expenses, but they're projects that we would not do if we didn't have the American Rescue Plan okay. funds. So if we weren't to do those projects, if we didn't have the funds, it would not, that would cancel each other out. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Lohman, and then Councilmember D'Alessandro. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so just uh, one question I had, I kind of try to take a uh, when anything like water or with uh, information technology, try to look at uh, from the standpoint of resilience. You know, I know we know that a number of institutions are, are getting attacked and are getting hacked. And I just wanted to know, you know, you know given what the mayor just said, um, you know, if there's you know, some imbalances there, if there's a catastrophic, um, uh, you know, hack or something like that, how would we position ourselves given this, uh, given this budget? I know, I mean, the, that's kind of a very vague and not um, uh, a very abstract thing, but I always think of, you know, you know how, how are we arranged? How, how would we handle something like that? I'm not, you know, thinking that's coming anytime soon, but I just want to be sure that we, from a resilience, and I'm not necessarily looking for an answer either, I want to be clear about this, has staff thought uh, about how to handle that within this, this particular fund if something like that would happen? Uh, yeah, I can take that one. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, uh, Council Members. Um, we have a few different things to look at. One is that we the city does carry cyber insurance, cyber security insurance. Um, and we also are part of a, a greater network of um, uh, with the Department of Homeland. So we are sort of having, um, we have a partner in the event that something catastrophic like that happened. We do have partners out there to assist the city um, you know, it's something that's always top of mind, you know, what would happen. But, um, I think with, um, the planning that we're, that we do on a regular basis, um, we're doing what we can to ensure that we would be resilient in, in the case of an attack like that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I don't want you to go any, any deeper than that. And I just, mm -hmm. uh, uh, having the opportunity to attend a number of national conferences and, and see what some of other uh, uh, city governments are going through um, that maybe don't have the sophistication as we do um, um, in maturity. Uh, with, I'm glad to hear that we have a plan uh, of action as it relates to that. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hi there, Ms. Cheney. <clears throat> um, there are capital charges uh, in this budget, and I was curious, I noticed in um, 2023 and 2024, those numbers are higher. I assume that something's coming due. Um, maybe maybe that's uh, an equipment purchase or something to that effect. I'm curious as to, uh, number one, if we can expound a little bit on what those are in 23, 24, and then um, is there any possibility for, I don't know if this is something that we do or not, but if it is capital, truly capital, is there, um, is, is that to be, can that be rolled into a bonding request as opposed to be put into the budget in the first couple, in the, in the two years specifically? Thank you. Sure. Yep. Uh, Mayor, council member, D'Alessandro, council members. Um, most of that for 23 and 24 is related to that fiber optics uh, expansion, and that is ARPA funding. Um, there are other equipment that we uh, budget for on a regular basis, like, um, network switches, servers, that sort of thing. Um, so it's usually a smaller amount than what you would see in the 23 and 24. Okay, clarification then. So you're saying that of the 605,000 in that, of uh, in 24, for example, 405,000 of, of, of the revenue associated with that is, is essentially offsetting that expense. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Council, additional questions, comments? Seeing none, very good. Thank you, Amy. Thank, Thank you. you, Amy. Move on to item 5.3, uh, discussion on the public safety budgets. That's the Police General Fund, Fire General Fund, Safety Tech and Equipment Fund, and Fire Pension Fund budgets. Yes, we are going to start off with police with Chief Hodges. Chief Hodges, good evening. How you going, Mayor City Council? Uh, got the presentation up yet? 
Good afternoon. Oh, yeah, I didn't bring my visual aids today. <laughs> I'm going to use my verbal aids instead. Um, so I would be remiss. Um, the number one question I've been getting asked, and I'll say this before I start here, is uh, from citizens in Bloomington is we've had this large state surplus. And why are we asking for a public safety increase? And a lot of my colleagues are doing the same thing in front of council, so I'd be remiss if I didn't let people know um, what I've been saying publicly, and I think it's from a public education standpoint. There were three public safety proposals this last legislative session. Uh, one passed in the Senate, uh, which was, would have, for what we're asking for today, would have given us about 75% of what we're asking for for our body camera purchase, which uh, we'll get into here today. The other, the uh, House led Democratic uh, public safety bill would have gave, it was like $9 million for the entire state, so that bill probably wouldn't have had any impact on us at all here in the city of Bloomington. Uh, the proposal that Governor Walls had put forth in the $300 million public safety bill would have gave the city $1.6 million. So if the legislature has the gumption to go back into uh, session, uh, the proposal that the governor had put forth would directly benefit the city of Bloomington more for what we're asking for here today for $1.6 million is what we would have got from the governor's proposal. So with that, I'll get started. As you can see on the first slide here, <laughs> sorry, do I need a clicker? Oh, oh, I'll get to control it too. Oh man, I don't know about that. Uh, <laughs> all right, so what we got here, uh, we're asking for an increase of $2.5 million. Um, over our 2022 budget, and I can get into some details and uh, slides moving forward regarding why we are asking for that. As you can see, we do have uh, increase in supplies and materials, obviously with uh, the cost of inflation, and the big increase you're going to see is in our services, which we're looking at about a $606,000 increase, and this is largely due to our contract with Axon. So what we initially asked for uh, was a total of about $3.5 million in costs, which was six additional police officers, a dispatch coordinator, a crime prevention coordinator, additional increases in overtime, uh, body camera and squad camera and tasers, supplies, and ARPA funds. So essentially, uh, there was a gap in funding between we had ARPA funds this year that we won't have next year, obviously and then uh, increase in salaries, uh, wages that were negotiated through union contracts. So what we settled on, uh, two additional police officers, a dispatch training coordinator, and our body squad camera and taser increase and supplies, training services, and again, employee uh, salary increases. The body camera, we everybody knows we wear these, but the increase in contracts is not just for body cameras, it's replacing our tasers and our squad video systems. Right now, uh, the way Axon works is all this stuff is packaged together. We were able to talk them down from originally, I think it was 562 down to $514,000, but in the public interest in the city, uh, citizens have wanted to have this transparency and without it, um, we would not be able to do what we do. And this not only affects the police department, it also would affect the uh, prosecutors in terms of prosecuting our cases. Agency comparison here, as you see why we're asking for additional bodies. Um, these are what we would consider comparable police departments in terms of size. Uh, Rochester has a population of 120,000 people. They have 150 officers. Bloomington, we have around 91,000 people, 123 officers. Duluth, 86,000 people. 158 officers, St. Cloud Police Department, around 70,000 people and 116 officers. So you can kind of see where the Bloomington Police Department fits in this. The difference between us and all those other police departments is they also have robust sheriff's offices that are able to support them with patrol divisions. Our Hennepin County Sheriff's Office does not have uh, a patrol division that's comparable to Olmstead County and Rochester, St. Louis County and uh, Stearns County. In St. Cloud. Crime. Um, overall crime in the city of Bloomington currently in comparison 
comparing January 1st through September 30th, going back to 2019 to current date is at a four year low here in the city of Bloomington. Uh, we are seeing an increase though in our catalytic converter thefts and we'll have an announcement on that tomorrow. We did catch one person or we caught a group today uh, under and they will be charged under our catalytic uh, converter uh, ordinance um, and we will be discussing that tomorrow. But our burglaries are down in, in the city of Bloomington right now. So, I mean, overall, like I said, crimes at a four-year low when you're comparison, comparing uh, going back to 2019. So with that, I will take any questions. Council, questions of Chief Hodges here. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just out of curiosity, you mentioned the, the um, county sheriff's department, but it still seems to me like there's a pretty significant, um, for lack of a better term, sort of ratio of people to sworn officers in Rochester. Um, how, I mean, how do you, to the best that you can, I suppose, how do you account for that? I, I mean, you know, I mean, everybody else is within, you know, 20, it looks like 23,000, 22,000 people and, you know, 100 to 160 officers. And then Rochester is close to 30,000 people more and still in that same range. How do you account for that? So Rochester, again, a lot of their operations is merged with the Olmstead County Sheriff's Office. I mean, they, they share the same building. Uh, the Sheriff's Office has a very robust patrol division where um, that would be my best guess for that. Um, that'd be my best guess. Okay, thank you. That, that's just, that just really sticks out to me as kind of an, an interesting Thing there, so. And I think their authorized strength is a little bit more than what's up there. This is what they had when we pulled the numbers here a few days ago. Councilmember Lohman, then Councilmember D'Alessandro, and then Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so when I, I look at the uh, the initial um, uh, budget request, uh, particularly the crime prevention uh, coordinator, um, you know, certainly I see that that tag. What does that provide? Because uh, we, you know, we lop that off as we kind of, what, what does that position provide for the community if we have that or don't have that? So right now we have one crime prevention coordinator. We would like to have two uh, to increase our outreach and neighborhood. So all of our social media stuff, all of our national night out stuff, the person when people call to uh, voice uh, traffic concerns, all those items are funneled through the crime prevention uh, coordinator. So if we had another person in there, we'd be able to increase those efforts and quite frankly, reach into some communities that um, we sometimes don't get an opportunity to do so. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. And then this is really more, um, uh, you know, of a question maybe for the city manager. You know, as I, I look at here, we got these six additional police officers um, and, uh, you know, we, we cut it from the, the six down to the, down to the two. Is there a, a plan at all in place as we look across a number of years to increase that? I know that, um, uh, or is there, there some type of goal or, or strategic kind of plan in terms of, yeah, we might cut this, this, this time around, but let's look to, to add more, uh, in another year. I, I just, I get concerned that we, uh, as I look at those numbers on the other slides, you know, that we're, we're, we'd be getting behind in terms of our capacity. And I think about some of the things that we want to do, you know, in future years uh, where that might be handy to have additional uh, officers around. So for example, if we're going to, if we do get the World's Fair piece, um, I, I just wonder, you know, are we ready to handle something like that? So I just uh, would be curious if, if there's a strategic plan in, in, in place or is it just whenever we can get uh, get those officers? Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Uh, the directors were each requested to put together a long-term staffing model. Uh, they have submitted those, and our executive team has it scheduled for later this year to start that planning process to look out five years plus uh, to understand what those um, staffing impacts are and the, you know, the consequences of de decisions associated with them uh, so that we can start plugging in where those requests fit within the budgeting priorities um, in, in a longer-term model than just a two-year budget. And I, I want to be careful, Mayor, not to, um, uh, uh, you know, 
get into the details and, and make suggestions, but I just would hope that as as we look, we're looking at uh, you know trying to put safety forward uh, uh, for this year and maybe in, in subsequent years that we um, really do look to if we have um, additional funding to, to try to really increase you know these different coordinator positions as we look to try to tackle uh, crime across the city. I know it's it's perceptional right now, and we're, we you know we just saw you know, that slide earlier today amongst many other ones. Um, and we also saw in this, the, the survey uh, how folks are feeling, but it doesn't take much to, to have that tide turn. And I just want to be sure that we're doing everything we can possibly do uh, uh, to uh, increase uh, that, that staffing. Um, so I thought it would be closer to that, that six uh, you know, in, uh, or seven if you include the, uh, uh, the crime prevention uh, coordinator uh, when we were moving forward with a, uh, a public safety um, uh, request, but again, I want to be careful about not talking numbers and that kind of detail. But as a policy standpoint, just just what I'd like to see. Um, it may, but I certainly trust uh, city manager's office to uh, and the directors to move us forward in the right direction. So Mr. Mayor and council members, council member Loman, appreciate the comments. Uh, also appreciate the recognition of of crime and the perception associated with it because I don't ever want to lose the opportunity here and. Uh, if I didn't say it, maybe the chief would to remind folks that we are at a four-year low in terms of actual numbers of crime right now. Um, that's, you know, always recognizing that those numbers can fluctuate, right? So just at the same time that we're saying, you know, we gotta, we're going to um, take the credit for the crime being at a four-year low. When crime starts to go up, we have to accept the responsibility that goes with that too. I think what we're trying to do is make sure that we have – a police department that reflects um, the needs, uh, adequate coverage, and anticipates where we're going in the future. So I know the chief and the, the command team are very focused on uh, externalities, such as what happens if we get Expo, right? I know they're looking closely at what the uh, tenure is amongst our uh, police officers and, and how uh, the retirement uh, is going to affect the department and how that's going to impact recruiting. Um, so I'm confident that they're doing what they need to do to start projecting forward. Um, but I don't ever want to miss a chance to say there's a perception of crime and then there's the reality of crime. And right now Bloomington uh, is, is um, uh, experiencing less crime than we have in the last four years. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> uh, I was curious uh, on two counts. Oh, and by the way, as an aside, I'm very much looking forward to that tomorrow. Um, not sure what prop you're going to use for catalytic converters, but I'm here for it. <laughs> uh, uh, so my question is around the in additional increase in overtime. Um, I know that we took that out. I'm wondering if the expectation is that that's being handled by contractual, or was that just uh, um, – an expectation that we would have um we would have that need on top because it's it's there to get i guess maybe what i'm trying to get to i apologize knowing that we're not we have a revised budget that only includes two instead of six i guess my thought would have been we'd have an increase in overtime requests because we had less officers and that doesn't look to be the case so i'm just i'm wondering to understand that a little bit more thank you so um while we were able to reduce that and this is everything goes according to plan the police department hasn't been fully staffed in recent years we're fully staffed now um so once all these people get trained the amount of overtime that we're going to have to pay for people to cover shifts should decrease so that's why the overtime was reduced so if we can keep ahead of staffing which i think we should be able to um we should be able to keep shift coverage over time down councilmember nelson Thank you, Mayor. Just a couple of quick questions. Um, first, if you happen to find a catalytic converter from a Chevy pickup truck in there, just let me know. I'm missing one. Oh, look. <laughs> so, uh, um, it's from Burnsville, though, so well, not Bloomington. Well, uh, it, hey, we ain't figured out where these people went yet. Yeah, so, yeah. fair enough. Um, uh, but uh, to the budget, um, when we looked at the staffing levels at the, the comparable cities, uh, did you also look at non-sworn and... Um, you know, is there any uh, subtle shifts in models where maybe some departments use non-sworn to do more administrative and, and keep the sworn officers out in the street more or anything like that? And are we still a little bit less than them? And then the other part of the question is, I think to your point just a minute ago, that we, for a long time, were understaffed. We weren't 
at our authorized uh, numbers? Do we know if the other communities are at their authorized numbers or if they're short staffed and what their actual staffing levels look like? So for most of these, these are their um, authorized strength and we are the only one that's fully staffed okay. in this list uh, currently right now. Um, non-sworn, I did not, I don't have those numbers here, but I can tell you, relatively speaking, Bloomington, we have less non-sworn staff than most police departments our size. I mean, we're, I think our, you know, we, we just, we don't have that many non-sworn staff to do I, a lot of stuff. So I'll give you an example. So like Brooklyn Park has six cadets that manage their jail. We have three part-timers to do that. And I think they got six full-time people to do that type of stuff. So oh. it's a little different. Okay. Good. Thank you for the information. Hmm? Council, anything additional? Very good. Thank you, Chief. Next up, we have the fire department with Chief Seal. Good evening. Good evening, Chief. Mayor, council members. Oh, yeah, I got control. <laughs> um, <laughs> how come you're laughing at that? <laughs> yeah, I got control issues. Um, so, significant difference, obviously, between 2022 and 2023. Two main areas, people and equipment. Both large fire equipment and small fire equipment have significant um, 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 additions, about a million bucks between those two funds. Is that correct? And then um, the people side of it is the additional six um, firefighters. So um, those are the two major um, differences as you look, fire small equipment, there's that $350,000 difference, fire large equipment, um, a little more than a half million dollars, and then um, um, the difference in, in salary and benefits is a million and a half dollars. And this is basically what, what I was just talking about. Um, the six additional firefighters, oh, there's a, an addition for the four firefighters that um, I came to you earlier this year and requested permission to hire, and I got. Um, and then um, there's an increase um, of $214,000 for our hourly rate for our paid-on-call firefighters, and then an increase in salaries of existing fire, fire department employees. It's really people and our large and our small fire equipment are two major, major contributors to this. And as you are aware, we got the SAFER grant, um, and we were awarded those, those dollars. We've got six months to um, hire 18 firefighters. Those dollars will cover the salaries and benefits for those uh, 18 firefighters for three years. So um, um, end of 25, um, 26, those firefighters come onto the budget in, in 26. Um, this obviously is something I've talked to you about numerous times before, um, the need for staffing and um, the effects this has on our ability to put trucks on the road as well as uh, um, affects our response times. And which feeds right into this next slide. I kind of updated this slide um, um, before what you saw was through May, I believe, and I ended June, July, August, and September. And it kind of gives you the the same, um, um, same slight degradation in some of our response metrics. Um, the total response time dropped to 57% rather than 65%, um, but our rolling with one or two firefighters stayed pretty, um, pretty steady, and, and same with our all-rookie crews. Um, calls are right around the same, um, same for all, all the months across. So. It's not getting better, I guess, is the point of that slide. And it won't until we, we do something about it. So 
Same thing here, um, just a difference between 2015 and 2021. Um, looking at, um, because as you recall, I talked to you that, uh, you know, I actually started tracking a lot of these metrics in 2007, and um, we've been struggling for a while, but considerably worse numbers um, between 2015 and 2021. And then the first part of this year, numbers as well. I think couple of things to notice in, and um, is that um, the times that we are un unable to staff a unit, now I will reassure everyone that every call gets a response, every call had a response. Many of our call types require multiple units to respond. So a structure fire requires multiple units to respond and we've been struggling getting all of those units that are assigned um, out the door with people. Um, this is just talking about structure fires, and we're trying to reach a goal of 11 minutes, 30 seconds, 90% of the time to get 15 firefighters on the fire ground. But I'll point out that standard was designed to apply to a one-story single-family dwelling. We're applying it to everything right now because we can't make the standard, even for a one-story single-family dwelling. So, and, and that just shows you what we've got up there and what, how, how we performed um, um, January through October. 17 structure fires and nine of those, um, um, you know, nine of those that required 14 to 35 minutes to get 15 firefighters on the fire ground. 35 minutes, yeah, that's a long time. Now, we've had one since October where, October 12th, where um, we, didn't, we didn't get one. We did not reach 15 firefighters on the scene. And that was an occupied hotel with a working structure fire in it. So we did put the fire out. <laughs> Some of the things that are concerning to us, of course, um, much like um, the police chief, is projected growth and development for the city, the increase in, uh, projected increase in housing units, projected increase in population, commercial development, the original 10-year plan that I come back to council with, um, uh, uh, for staffing the department over 10 years is probably going to have to be accelerated um, as we take uh, into account some of the development that's going to happen in the, and the uh, increase in population. Um, more people um, you put into an area, the more people that call for help. So, Fire pension fund. I may bail out on this a little bit and let Kari talk, but I'll start off on it. So um, our pit on call firefighters that serve for 20 years and they have to serve the entire 20 years qualify for a pension. And financial markets and how well the markets do at the end of the year have a big impact on the annual pension obligation for the city. For example, the end of this year, 2022, will have a significant impact on the pension obligation for 2024. The end of 2021 is what set the pension obligation for 2023. Um, so in years where investment returns were low, at the year end, the city has had to contribute, uh, contribute significant amounts, um, $3.8 million in both 2010 and 2011, um, right after the 2008 downturn. At the end of 2008, you know, um, um, that's where those you start getting the skip in the years and and even though we were starting to come back in 2010 and 2011, the results of the previous year's um, downturn were still significantly impacting the, uh, uh, the pension fund. Uh, fortunately, investment returns at a high at the end of 2021. Um, and uh, so we were uh, funded over our threshold of 120%. So we're just doing pass-through of state aid so, uh, of 2020, uh, in 2023. Now, um, as was mentioned earlier this evening, um, we have um, created a fund in the city that there is a line item in the fire department budget every year to put money into that fund to smooth out those $3.8 million years when, when markets aren't kind. Um, so that's the reason for that fund and the reason for trying to maintain a fund balance there, which is this slide here. Um, and so that fund balance going forward is what we're trying to maintain so that we can um, have a, a smoothing of the impact of the tax levy from year to year on years where we have um, 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 
to play catch up for um, investment performance. Um, and I will say this, that the, uh, uh, the Relief Association Fund's um, um, benchmark with most of the other major funds and match the, the other uh, major funds, which means when they have bad years, we have bad years. When they have good years, we have good years. Um, and that's kind of the way it is for everybody, right? Um, so our working capital balance moving forward is this, is this is one of those funds that I think all of our working capital balances are, are important to try to maintain, but this is one that will have a significant impact on the tax levy if we don't because we are legislatively mandated to uh, uh, make those pension payments. Do you, did I miss anything? Public safety technology and equipment. Now I'm going to speak and, and uh, this um, um, encompasses more than just the fire department, it also encompasses the police department. And it covers radio operations, mobile data computers, MDC, which are mobile data computers, replacements, uh, body camera data fees, police small equipment, fire small equipment, and fire large equipment. All right, And I don't want to get into a, a comparison between police equipment and fire equipment because they, they can't keep up with me. So. <laughs> um, all, all, of, all of the fire department's toys are much, much more expensive. Um, and this kind of lays out the radio, uh, the radio uh, public safety radio fund and the MDCs um, and the projection um, going forward, as you see, 2024, 25, and 26. There's some significant expenditures out of this fund for MDCs, um, um, radios, and um, I'll also include some public works radios in this fund as well. But police radios, public works radios, fire radios, and MDCs in those three years. And you see, um, the, you know, across those three years is about a $2 million set of expenditures. Large fire equipment, small fire equipment, police equipment. This is what I was just talking about. Um, and um, um, significant expenditures coming uh, forward once again um, in 2020. Uh, well, 2023 has got a ladder truck that we've already got ordered on order. Um, it's got about a 600-day build time to it. Um, in 2024, um, there are two engines, um, another 600-day build time on those. So we probably won't get the ladder until 2024 and the engines until 2025. So some of these funds will be carried over to cover those expenses. And then 2026, we've got another large truck on, online. And small equipment, um, um, some of those numbers um, are, are gone up from years in past, and that was kind of a notice I gave a couple of years ago to folks that I've got some equipment coming due for replacement. And I've talked about this before. Um, the turnout gear that we put our firefighters in costs about $8,000 um, $8, for two sets for one firefighter, and that has a 10-year shelf life. Um, as well as a lot of the other equipment we have that has a shelf life on it that we have to replace. And we try to program that out over several years, and that's why you can see 23, 24, and 25, 26 are all pretty constant across there as, as we're trying to program this stuff out. And then the police, um, police equipment. Public safety, this is the spreadsheet that you look at, and you can see our our working capital balance um, going forward um, and the funds that we need to keep into that uh, capital funding balance. And I will tell you that, that while this is one little piece of that spreadsheet, um, finance has done a really good job of projecting this out for, for more years. And that green line, if we don't put money into those fund balances, um, turns yellow or the dreaded red. All right. What do you what do I what you gotta you gotta correct got me on anything? Up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Seal. Council questions. Councilmember D'Alessandro and then Councilmember Carter. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just I I might have to tie these two back together. I just had a quick question about I, I think um in the propose or in the uh, presentation that Chief Seal just gave, there was a commentary there that there's um um uh, half of the um, the um, 
I guess it was the body camera software is paid by IT and the other half is paid by that. Is that correct or did I misunderstand that? Um, and I just wanted to make sure I understood um, that against what we saw in the police presentation. Yes. Oh, good. It's working. Um, Mayor and council members, council member D'Alessandro, that was an error okay. um, that in that slide. I just noticed as it went by. So it used to be um, the, date, the body camera fees did um, get charged to the police general fund and then um and i'm sorry that's not correct it, they were that's how they used to work is it um paid a portion of it and um there's a police drug forfeiture fund that paid a portion and they were a lot lower um and this year when the new axon contract came on this there was no funding source to, to, that could come through here and um and fund those costs. And since they were all, it was going to have to either come through this fund and get all charged to the police general fund, or else we just put it right in the police general fund because it was just going to one place. Okay. So that is a change um, from past years and um, with this new contract. And so like, if you go back to the long-term model, there's a line in the expenses for, um, it'll say body camera fees and it's zeros out starting in 2023. Great. Okay. So the um, so the net net is that the body camera fee in this fund is zeroing out over time because it's being picked up in the police general fund, and that was that five hundred and fourteen thousand dollar number or so, right? Okay. Um, and I know that's inclusive of other things. Um, and then was I didn't see it, and I apologize for not thinking about it until now, but. In the IT budget, do we have a similar line item then that goes to zero? Yes. Uh, Mayor, City Council Members, Council Member D'Alessandro, there was a transfer to this fund that it was, used to be $50,000 that is now zero in the, in the IT fund. Okay, great. Thank you. Council Member Carter. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I mentioned this to you earlier, so not totally unexpected. <laughs> uh, we did have somebody join us at the listening session earlier tonight and uh, mentioned that some conversations he's had uh, with people related to um, the levy request and supporting the uh, expansion of the fire department uh, is related to the fire insurance rating that we have somewhere on our website that is maybe a little out of date. Um, and so I'm just wondering, so on our website it says that we rate a two with one being the highest. And so I guess, could you speak to why that's not really applicable um, as we continue to have these conversations? Again, this is just for kind of the general public to understand as well. That's referring to our ISO rating. Okay. ISO is the Insurance Services Organization, which is a private for-profit entity that grades fire departments across the country and provides rating schedules to sell to insurance companies so they can then charge an appropriate amount of, of fire insurance to homeowners across the country. Um, they do ratings, they used to do ratings of fire departments every 10 years. Um, they started doing it every five years. Um, they haven't kept to that schedule um, at this particular time because it's over five years ago that the last time we were rated. Um, there's two points to that. One point is, is that um, when they rate fire departments, they rate fire departments based upon their ability to respond to and suppress structure fires. It's all about buildings. It has nothing to do with people or any of the other things that we do, like going to car crashes or, or anything else that we do. So they only care about um, response to structure fires and saving uh, buildings. Um, the other thing I will say is that was over five years ago when we were raided, and I was uh, probably had 135 firefighters then rather than 99 firefighters, and I have significant reservations on what our rating would look like if we were raided today. Thank you. Councilmember Coulter and then Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to clarify, and maybe I'm just missing it, but I see the slide, the, the 2023 preliminary budget request. Am I, I did not see the way we did, for example, with the police department, an updated request. Am I okay in assuming that the preliminary is the same as the updated or have there been any changes? It's the same. Okay, that's that's what I, I had I, to check with my bookkeeper to make sure. But. <laughs> Fair enough. That's that's what I assumed. I just wanted yes. to make sure that I was understanding that correctly. Thank you, Councilmember Loman. 
so I'll, I'll ask this again. I'll keep asking it because I think that it will come up um, as we get closer to the budget uh, decision process. So we we got a uh, our, our safer grant uh, for uh, for 18 folks, and then there were roughly 10 other people, so up to 28 um, uh, for this year. And certainly we're losing uh, uh, folks, as you've uh, shown in the in the slide. So since we have that grant. Couldn't we reduce uh, the um, the amount uh, of our, our our levy that we'd put into uh, fire, or um, try to think of another way way, way of putting this? But uh. Council Member Lohman, um, <laughs> Mayor, Council Members, um, the Council sets this, and they can do really whatever they see fit. Absolutely. Um, my argument um, to the City Manager was that I'm way behind. Um, if I can get the grants been a gift, we weren't sure we were gonna get the grant. So when we um, did the budget work for 23 and 24, we added, we had in for both 23 and 24, six additional firefighters for both years and subsequent years going out. But um, uh, my argument was is that I'm so far behind that I could, I need the six as well as the 18. The 18 is a gift. I still need the six, and the six after that, looking at um, the expansion and growth in the city, housing units, World's Fair, all the things that are happening that, that the police chief also spoke to are, are affecting the fire department as well. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Lohman. Uh, it is a good question. It's the right question to ask as we start zeroing in on where we're going to be for our final levy uh, in, in early December. And um, frankly, our executive team hasn't had a chance to work through those options yet. So uh, we have more discussion amongst ourselves, uh, figuring out what we want to do in terms of a recommendation for the council. Thank you for that clarification. I just, I, I, I'd like to just say, um, uh, from my, my perspective, even though I'm, I'm, I'm not a city manager, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to see, um, you know, us press as much as we can into those those uh, fire roles and also through our police roles as much as we possibly can uh, just so that we are prepared for uh, any eventuality that, that, that comes forward. I just think that that's just prudent and I think that uh, as we look across uh, the, the demographics as those shift and change, uh, I think that the, the price of getting those particular uh, roles are going to only increase. So I think it would behoove us to try to, to take, that, uh, take that hit now as opposed to a more expensive hit uh, later down the road. But that's just one council member's perspective. Thank you, Council Member Lohman. Council, any additional comments, questions? Chief Seal, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Move on to item 5.4. And this budget discussion is on fleet and facilities, internal service funds, and public works general fund budgets. And here come the requisite yes. folks to talk about that. Good evening. Welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mayor Council Members. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to introduce you. Um, Michael Keim, our fleet manager, is going to go through the fleet fund. All right, uh, what we do in fleet is we maintain and repair, buy and sell all the equipment for the city of Bloomington. Uh, that includes the snowplow trucks that you see out there, it includes the lawn mowers over the summertime, the trailers, the sidewalk plows, basically if it has an engine or wheels, we take care of it. Um, our overall goal is make sure that we have the lowest lifetime cost of ownership for each of those classes of vehicles, save the taxpayer money, as well as make sure that the vehicle is reliable for these other departments to use their equipment because it is a tool necessary for them to do their job. Um, our total request for the 2023 budget, which includes both of our capital and our operational costs, is just shy of $9 million. Uh, we have 12 full-time employees, including myself. Again, looking at our operational budget over time, we have managed to keep this fairly static over the last you know, 10 years. Uh, we've been doing that by making sure that we review all of our internal processes. Uh, we've revamped how we do some of our servicing. Um, 
will be reflected a little bit later, we, we're trying to be more proactive as opposed to reactive. Uh, one, it saves money because you're not fixing stuff when it's broken, you're, you're repairing it, as well as it helps you plan. Uh, again, I said these, uh, this equipment is the tools for these other departments to do their job. If they have an unexpected breakdown, that is negatively affecting how they can perform services for the citizens. So obviously the more we can do proactive as opposed to reactive is a good thing. Um, and also, as you see here, it pretty well saves us money as well. One thing we are asking for money, more money this year is on our capital costs. Vehicle costs have gone up quite a bit this year. On top of the cost of the vehicles themselves going up, most of our vehicles we purchase off of cooperative agreements, being a government agency. Um, as opposed to going out for a request for bid, multiple month process, there's agencies that have these vehicles already under contract. Um, Sourcewell is one of the big ones. And by utilizing those, we can save a lot of time in procuring these things. Uh, very important this day and age. Uh, there was one model that it was open for eight hours to order a new vehicle this year. Um, so there's some super duty trucks that the window is forecast to be three days, but if they get enough orders, that could be shorter this year. So having those contracts in place is imperative to be able to get these things replaced on time. Um, on top of the vehicles costing more, uh, the discounts we've seen this last year, some of these vehicles we used to get about a 25% discount that has dropped to a 3% discount from retail costs. So we really got squeezed pretty hard on that. So we are looking to increase our capital budget to keep our replacements on schedule. Hey, Mike, before you proceed, um, thank you, Mayor and Council members. I just want to point out, if you're looking at your packet and then looking at the screen, you might think these charts don't look alike. Um, we reversed them. So they were going from current year backwards when they were put into the into the packet. And so uh, Mike and, and Kari fixed it today, so we flipped it around so that you're normally seeing it from past to uh, current. I'll take full responsibility. I took it as a data dump out of our financial software and I didn't flip it. <laughs> All right. You, you had me completely stumped. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'll take full responsibility on that one. Thank you, Mayor, or manager. Again, uh, this is going back to what I was saying, where we're trying to be proactive as opposed to reactive. And I went back to 2011 and we tracked the total number of work orders, uh, time a vehicle was in for service, and how much of that is reactive versus proactive. And as you can see, um, you know, there's been a little bit of ups and downs, but generally we're trending in the right direction, and we are now doing more proactive than reactive, and that has decreased our total number of repairs needed completely. So uh, definitely trending in the right direction. want to show you what we're doing and why we're doing it. One of the strategic priorities for the council is, you know, being good stewards of our environment. I'm a huge fan, huge proponent of that. Uh, one of the things that we did this year when we did our 20 year vehicle replacement studies, we looked at the vehicles out there right now that there are viable EVs for. Um, when I say right now, obviously technology is improving. There's most likely going to be more viable options in the future, but currently there's 60 units that we have earmarked for replacing with EVs as they come due in their natural replacement cycle. Um, Excel Energy has been a good partner with us. They actually picked up the tab for installing a bunch of new chargers that we have for this next batch of electric vehicles we have coming on board. We did have to buy the charging system themselves, but they carried the cost for all the infrastructure, all the wires in the ground, the new box, which is also going to allow us to utilize off-peak charging, uh, drop our charging rates for those. So um, they've been an excellent partner for us. I think. Would you like me to take this on? So um, here's the long-term model for the fleet fund and with a working capital balance. And so for 2023, the revenues are just over 7.7 .7 million. So those are split up in the maintenance charges to departments and the replacement charges department to departments. You can see the replacement charges are a lot higher than last year, but the uh, maintenance charges are, are down a, a bit. Um, and then uh, we also have budgeted expenses that are just under $9 million as uh, Michael went through. And the working capital for this fund, it does dip down a bit. It goes into the yellow, the 80% to 90% range of the goal um, for, from 2024 to 2028. But then it comes back up in line with the goal of this fund 
further out in 2029. I believe that is all we have. Uh, is there any questions for us? Council questions on the fleet fund? Councilmember D'Alessandro. Would you mind putting the chart back up there? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I just wanted to um, understand, a, well, first off, um, I, I'm sad that the uh, we're spending more on vehicles just because, um, uh, you know, there are profits being taken um, at higher rates than, I mean, the cost of building the car hasn't really gone up, let's put it that way, right? It's just the cost of selling them. Uh, um, okay, um, my, my thoughts here were about um, the, in the pie chart that you had that kind of divided up the um, expenses, um, overhead was about a quarter or so of the number, and I, and I can't between that pie chart and then the budget line item reconcile what goes into that yellow bucket. I'm hoping that you could articulate that for us. Thank you. Sure. Uh, about 500000 of that is facilities cost. So about 10% of our overall budget is facilities cost. Um, we also pay 300000 roughly into back into the general fund, um, internal service fund, I believe is how it's. Yes. So the, um, the general fund does charge back to the non-general funds. So they charge back for the finance department, the legal department, administration department. So it charges to the utility funds um, as well as the internal service funds and other enterprise funds. And the follow-up here real quick, that 500000 so you said the facilities cost, I'm assuming that's the garage? Correct. Um, so the, is the, and maybe this is a question for you, Mr. Ma uh, manager, the, I know we have a garage capital project, correct? That's not indicated here, correct? That'd be that was in the CIP that we looked at two weeks ago or whatever it was. Is correct. that right? Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Delisandro, um, we this year we acquired the property for where that will be located. Uh, we have that in the CIP for uh, beginning work, I believe, in twenty four and and finishing construction in twenty five. Correct. Yeah. Then is the is the um, projected cost for from uh, that perspective for that overhead inclusive of the new facility? Then, uh, meaning, will they take? Oh, I guess we will be using it by twenty five or twenty six. I think we'd be looking at moving in twenty five. Uh, I do not believe that we have adjusted um, any any facility usage charges based on what the expectation is for how that um, building will function. And we probably won't until we get, I think, further into the construction project. Okay. Thanks. Appreciate it. Council, additional questions on the fleet fund? If not, let's move on to the facilities. Thank you. Internal Thanks, fund. Michael. Good evening. Good evening, Carl. So our facilities fund, again, is the, the second internal service fund in public works. Uh, this fund is in charge of or responsible for the maintenance and capital repairs of our 58 buildings, our fire stations, and the cemetery, and the operation of the cemetery. Uh, we have 14 full-time folks, which includes uh, the proposal for one additional person in 2023. This is for a porter at that city hall. Um, and Gen and our total budget is in the range of uh, $7.3 million a year, as proposed for 2023. Uh, budget has kind of two main components, our operating expenses, which are the, all the typical things you'd expect in a, in a facilities, including our staff, utility bills, uh, kind of the contractual costs that we have associated with it, uh, and that uh, set of internal charges that we just talked about in our fleet uh, operation. Uh, and we also a number of capital projects, which are scheduled uh, replacements or larger maintenance projects on our facilities. Would note that this does not include the capital improvement projects that are part of the CIP, the larger projects like the fleet garage or if we had a, uh, a new auditorium here, all those types of things are not included in, in these charges. Those are done separately. <laughs> Uh, the revenue to this fund is, is 
solely from space and occupancy charges to other operations. So these show up in all those other budgets. Um, and the building repairs, the larger ones, are either paid for through the fund balances in this or they are through the capital improvement program. Uh, you may recall earlier this year we presented you with a facilities service assessment. This is kind of that process that we use in most of our major operations across the city to kind of look in detail at how our operations are functioning, compare them to other similar operations around the country and to make recommendations. I uh, would note that uh, that process uh, recommended that we hire a number of new positions and kind of reorganize a little bit in, faci in facilities. Uh, the first is the hiring of a facilities manager. Uh, notes that that process is in process. Uh, happy to report that we have a new facilities manager will be starting with us a week from now. Um, Christia Davern is her name. She comes to us with a significant amount of experience uh, in kind of professional facilities management at the University of Minnesota. So we're very excited about that add to our group. Um, in the budget proposed for 2023 is, as I noted, a civil Civic Plaza Porter. This is a, a new maintenance position that would be responsible for managing things over here at Civic Plaza. Uh, in our service assessment, we found that there was uh, a rather large portion of the time spent by our kind of professional technicians on setting up rooms, taking care of bathroom types of things, uh, kind of day-to-day uh, -day activities, and it would be uh, important to try to relieve them of those duties and so thus the suggestion to hire a porter here at City Plaza, Civic Plaza. Um, the, we ha so that position is included in the proposed budget for 2023. Um, the service assessment also suggested that we hire four new technicians uh, uh, as well and we had proposing to do that one a year. Uh, initially we had suggested one for 2023 uh, that is not included in the, in the proposed budget this year. Um, we anticipate that we'll make a request again uh, the following year for that. Uh, would note a big change that we made this, this year was that in the past, park maintenance uh, was part of the facilities fund and then there was a cross charge from, from the facilities fund to the park and recreation operation. Uh, that is now part of the general fund expenditures in public works and we felt it's just a, a more clear and, and kind of open way to account for that. Um, and so in the proposed 2023 budget that remains as part of the public works general fund uh, amount and I'll speak to that in our next presentation. With that, uh, Kari's going to make some comments on the long-term model. Um, thank you. So the long-term model for the internal services fund for the facility maintenance um, it, the working capital balance looks healthy compared to the goal and the budgeted revenues are uh, just over 6.6 .6 million for 2023. Those are the charges out to departments uh, mainly and the expenses are just over us uh, or a little over $7.3 million. And, um, and you can also see that for capital outlay that part of that expense is um, 2.3 million is um, part of that expense that's projected for 2023. And then um, internal expenses of a uh, million dollars. Are there any questions for Carl or me for the facility maintenance internal service fund? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Keel, if we haven't looked at it in a while, but if we put up that a colorful chart that we have of our facilities condition assessment. Yes. Uh, what would that look like now, and how does the budget that you bring forward? How does it affect that? Is it able to start? Is it able to chip away at some of those issues in our? I don't think it was, we didn't call it an FCA, did we? FCI. Yes. Um, is it able to chip away at some of those things, or is that more? Are, are those more things that require a, a major capital overhaul to actually make an impact in that? The real colorful facilities that are part of that graph are the ones that are in very, very poor condition, and they're well beyond regular maintenance activities. So, our the activities that are part of this budget do little to change the the dramatic effect of the colors of that graph that you 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 are talking about. That is primarily handled by the larger projects that are in our capital improvement program. 
Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I would note also on that chart, you know, our replacement is focused on those ones that are yeah. very colorful. And the, yeah. the, the buildings that we're proposing over the next several years to replace are all in, in that uh, far to the right category. Uh, and I would echo what Carl said and emphasize that, you know, when we, when we did our facilities assessment, um, our service assessment, um, one of the things they really stressed was the importance of identifying, again, the service level expectations and um, having a program to keep the other facilities from getting into those colors, right? So by more actively managing it, we're going to um, push off, um, you know, the aging and deterioration through more active um, facility maintenance. Good to hear. Good to hear. Councilmember Lohman. So, so along those same lines, because uh, I had a very similar type of question, um, and I just made the assumption that you know that we uh, track our you know capital expenses um, or what we're going to do from a maintenance standpoint uh, across the different budgets doing that. But is there a way that that cities use to try to to try to say, hey, we've we've changed the model of our staffing so that we can be more proactive, kind of like what we saw uh, with the fleet piece where you saw the chart. Is there a way to, to, to track that? I know I asked this before when that, that, that service agreement came before us. Um, is there a way to track that so that we can kind of show, hey, you know, we, we changed the model of our staffing. Yeah, we're, we might be paying a little bit more for, for staffing here, but on the, in the long term here, you're going to see all these benefits and a reduction in the, uh, the amount of money we have to put towards uh, maintenance because we're being proactive. So does that make sense, what, what yeah. I'm asking here? Okay. And I think the, the short answer is absolutely yes. I mean, I think what you're talking about is an active and well-used asset management program, similar to how we do things with, with our streets and our pavement management program. So we have kind of the beginnings of a very good asset management program in our fleet, fleet operations. That's how we came up with these facilities indexes uh, and, and a good inventory of where we sit with all our facilities. Uh, but we are not doing as strong a job of uh, tracking and programming our ongoing maintenance so that we are, as Michael had talked about, being more proactive and less reactive. We are primarily in a reactive mode currently. Um, and really, that is going to be the primary challenge of our new facilities manager. And, uh, and we have hired that person, and she will, she will help us make that transition to, to a proactive asset management program. Well, I, I look forward to seeing that, and I hope that we, we are not uh, militantly modest about, about you know, the successes that we see with that. So I think the taxpayers need to see uh, that we're not just hiring staff for the, the sheer fact of hiring. I've heard that before where, where uh, uh, folks will come before us and say, hey, you know, we're just hiring people, but we could then show here's, you know, the benefit over over time uh, for doing that. And I'm, I'm really excited about seeing that. I know uh, not folks get too excited about that, but I do get excited about seeing because I think that's really a way for us to be um, not only um, – uh, fiscally sustainable, but also in another way, we're also being uh, uh, sustainable for the environment by, by doing that as well, by, by getting ahead of those those, those small little things. Uh, they all add up to, to big big savings long term. I would note that if, if we are successful in that, and we fully intend to be, that we should reduce the overall uh, life cycle cost of our facilities, but we should also see an increase in the service we're providing. We should, they should be in better condition, and the, and the services we're providing should be higher. Any other questions, Council? Seeing none, let's move on to the Public Works General Fund. Oh, it's, an, How is that one gonna it's pop another up? presentation. All right. So the public works general fund. So these are por the, those portions of public works that are not uh, the internal service funds that we've talked about or the utility funds that you had looked at at your last meeting. Um, so in total, this portion of, of our operation accounts for approximately $20 million worth of expenditure. Um, and I'll go through each of those categories kind of broadly, and then after that, we have a number of topic areas that you have expressed interest in the past that we'll go into a bit more detail. So the areas we're talking about are Public Works Administration uh, through Public Works Street Maintenance, and I'll go through each. Public Works Administration 
this is the area that provides support uh, to all the other uh, divisions within public works. Um, it includes uh, kind of operations like accounting and safety, uh, training, uh, also includes our sustainability efforts. Uh, five people are currently in the, in the Public Works Administration area, uh, and we're proposing an additional person in sustainability, which is part of this proposal, uh, and we can go into more detail. This is one of the special topic areas that we'll talk about a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, Public Works Administration is about $767,000. Uh, engineering is that portion of our operation that takes care of the design, construction, and kind of main, or, uh, ongoing um, data associated with our infrastructure. Uh, it manages quite a wide range of infrastructure. Uh, it counts for 26 full-time employees. Uh, two of those employees, uh, used to be 28, two of those employees, which was mentioned earlier in the IT presentation, uh, were moved, were GIS folks that were moved to IT. Uh, the proposed budget in 23 for engineering services is $2.1 million. Uh, in our maintenance area, we have our maintenance uh, administration area, which accounts for nine full-time employees. Uh, and these provide kind of the oversight for all the other operations in our maintenance division. Um, uh, kind of a big chunk of this is the operations and maintenance of our streetlight system. Um, and this accounts for $2.8 million in 2023. <clears throat> I had mentioned before, park maintenance is now part of our general fund op, uh, budget. Uh, it used to be part of the facilities fund and was charged back to park and recreation. Um, this is, an, is a, an operation that accounts for 28 FTEs, um, and we're actually proposing one additional in, in 2023, which is a new natural resources park maintenance personnel. Again, this is to address kind of the growing needs and, and uh, requests from the community and from the council for a bigger emphasis on park uh, maintenance in the area of natural resources. Uh, this, this accounts for $6.8 million. <coughs> Street maintenance, these are the activities associated with our pavement management program, like uh, seal coating and uh, pothole patching and, and uh, routing and filling of cracks, et cetera. Uh, we have 24 people, uh, mostly maintenance workers, in our, our street maintenance group, and they account for about $8 million worth of activities. Um, I would note that this also includes our snow plowing efforts, which are kind of a major um, service that we provide in the winter. That's a very brief kind of overview of, the, of these areas, and then we'll move directly into the, the uh, topic areas. And we have topic experts that are, are able to, to address these in more detail. Dave? Dave thanks. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thanks for having me tonight to talk about these special topics. First one is sidewalk snow plowing. Um, just a little background on the issue. Um, and some, um, some facts around it anyway. So every time it snows, Bloomington plows approximately 270 miles of sidewalks. Um, we do this with 10 routes and staffing and equipment for 10 routes. Within each of those routes are priority levels. Uh, so the first priority would be school routes where students walk to school, and then areas where we know there are people with mobility issues. Um, our second level of priority is high speed, high traffic roads. And then the third priority level would be residential sidewalks in neighborhoods that don't have anything in the first two priority categories going for them. Um, snow events can take up to three days to clear. Uh, a lot of the times we have to go back and replow things multiple times throughout the event to get it satisfactory. Um, and this is unlike our other plowing operations. So most of our other plowing operations are done the same day. Um, sidewalk plowing takes up to three days often. Um, this leads to confusion from the residents and they wonder why my street was plowed and um, you know, three days later, my sidewalk isn't. Um, it's further complicated 
um, in that you know sidewalks are uneven, they're narrow, they're windy. Um, after a snowfall, it's a sea of white out there, and you may or not be able to tell where the sidewalk actually is underneath the snow. Um, we also know that uh, we have higher work and compensation claims um, compared to other snow plowing routes. Um, it could be the, the roughness of the terrain and the equipment. Um, and we also know that they spend long, long hours in these machines getting through their routes. In our initial budget request, um, we, uh, we put in for $800,000 for four new machines and four staff to operate them. Uh, they would have coincided, coincided with additional staff for natural resources, um, which Carl touched on. Um, this would allow for additional routes, routes that would improve our completion time by a factor of about 40%, making it more in alignment with our other plowing operations and, and consequently reduce the number of hours that operators spent doing those routes each time it snowed. Um, this is no longer in the budget for this year. Um, some future considerations we can look at. Um, we could consider suspending all or part of the operation um, and relying on the city ordinance that's on the books that puts the responsibility back on the property owner for that. Um, you know, if, if we eliminated like the, the third priority sidewalks, that would allow us to focus more time and resources on the higher priorities, getting through them quicker, um, essentially putting them where they're more needed. Um, we could revisit the added staff and equipment. Um, and then we're also looking at additional safety improvements to the equipment like GPS units. Um, we're working with one vendor now that uh, provides us with a map and an ability to mark a hazard so that the operators have a heads up when they come back or if somebody new is in the route, they know that it's there buried underneath the snow. Um, some of that work is being funded by an OSHA safety grant that we were awarded this year. Um, and we're continuing to, to work with those products to refine it to make it um, what we need it to. It's not off the shelf stuff, it's things that we're working through with vendors. So do we want to stop for questions on the sidewalk plowing portion of this or just steam on through? Sure, why don't we, if we could, just, okay. I see Council Member Martin. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Um, so uh, to, to clarify, you mentioned that uh, 270 miles, there's been some thinking, obviously, in terms of the populations that those sidewalks are serving and why those have been prioritized to this point. Yep. Okay, uh, so at, moving forward, I guess I would be curious as we narrow in on level of service, categorizations of those populations. I just think of it from an equity perspective, is that folks that are dependent on transit and need to walk those sidewalks is whatever it may be, just so once once we have a recommendation of, say, reduced miles of service but higher quality in certain areas, mm -hmm. what populations are we trying to be most effective for would be helpful for me. Right. Thank you. Um, Mayor, Council Member, Council Member Martin, we have not considered that. We have simply looked at serving uh, youth walking to schools and then where we know we have concentrations of people that are um, mobility challenged so and in the future we would do that and, uh, and so of the 270 that's the two cri criteria we're operating off of right now for the for the first priority for the highest level priority oh, okay and then we we typically look at higher traffic roads where <laughs> we don't want people to be tempted to walk in the road because it isn't plowed so we try and get to those uh, as quickly as we can after we've we've made the the first priority all walkable. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. Councilmember Carter and then Councilmember Dallas Hondo. Council uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so, can you uh, just talk a little bit about why we don't enforce our ordinance currently? I guess I'm just kind of interested in the history there. Um, and I would my understanding then is that that's kind of the third tier, third priority, which is mostly residential streets. Sure, I'll take a yep. run at that, Mayor, Council Member Carter. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Why we we have, why we do that? We we. But I can tell you, we always have. I bet um, Mr. Keel knows. Yes. I don't know if definitively, but my understanding is that uh, typically when we were talking about constructing pathways and sidewalks, people were generally not happy about having them 
built in the first place. And as an accommodation to that, uh, the council said, well, we'll take care of maintenance of them, so you won't have to worry with that. And, and it was sort of part of the sales of, of those initial facilities, and it became a practice. And so now it is just a fairly well-established practice. That's my understanding of it. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I guess I, I'm assuming that these future decisions are gonna come down the pike for us at, at in a future meeting as part of whether or not we wanna fund the ongoing concern of snowplow maintenance. Is that the idea here? Uh, yes, I, I, Council Member, yes, I think that's the idea. I think they've they've taken it out of the budget for now, but it, then it becomes a council discussion as to whether or not it, it's priority a priority enough to put back in. Right. Okay. Um, so the only question that I would add ask then is part of like part of that con conversation is to understand um, the uh, impact of our decision on what's also supposed to be coming back which is you know our active transportation plan and our and all of those things like how do they go together so if on one hand we're adding more sidewalks and on the other hand we're saying we're not going to maintain them from a snowplow perspective um you know what does that look like and then i don't know if that comes together related to um the increase in bike paths and other things we're also considering but i'd like to i don't know if that can be more comprehensively looked at but i'd hate to make this decision and then have have it ha adversely affect us in in the you know in, in a way if that makes sense uh because we we didn't have all of that information at one time uh, that, that does make sense and that's a good point uh, thank you mr keel mayor council member del sandro uh you will recall that you funded through uh, uh special priorities from strategic priorities this year the funding of that study, our active transportation study, and the, included in the scope of that is an analysis of exactly what you're describing. So. Councilmember Lohman. Um, I just wanted to mention that I, to me, kind of something something old is new again. It's kind of funny to see this this whole thing back here again. That's why I was kind of smirking looking at you, is that I remember we looked at this before, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be curious to see how this council uh, looks at it, so I don't want to. I don't want to prejudice uh, <laughs> uh, any views of it, but I, I just I thought it was interesting to see this back again. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> and we move on to natural resources. Oh, thank you. Um, this has already been mentioned tonight a couple times, but the park system master plan indicated from much feedback from the community, a desire for enhanced natural resources, opportunities and condition throughout Bloomington and in the parks. Um, and as Carl just mentioned, staff has been realigned to allow somebody to focus more on that and that's partly me um, and manage natural resources with more of my time. Um, currently we maintain 132 acres uh, that we've already restored, some going back decades of prairie and uh, 42 acres of woodland that's down along uh, the bluff. Um, we have reduced a program for reduced frequency mowing on still on 24 acres of, uh, of turf. And this is really all about converting conventional turf grass to native prairie where it makes sense and where we can do it. Um, where it's possible in parks. Uh, some of our next steps for natural resources is, well, we talked to you a month ago about the, the, the prioritization plan. It, it's to begin implementing that. Um, those numbers are the same. To cover the nine priority parks for restoration and maintenance for 20 years is just under $4 million. And then Bloomington has the opportunity of restoring roughly 2,300 acres throughout the city. Um, this would be in the River Valley and out of the River Valley. Additional next steps, and this talks about what we, what we have for funding right now. Um, so we're, we're beginning to use the uh, $350,000 of mid-year strategic priority money, um, applying that to a project at at uh, Moyer and Bush Lake in Central Park. Um, we have $500,000 worth of American Rescue Plan funds available for natural resources if we choose to use it on one of these projects or direct it towards one of the 
park redevelopment projects that is uh, on the way. Um, and then we're also seeking grant funds from outside sources. A month ago, we talked about um, applying for the Conservation Partners Legacy Grant through the DNR of $250,000 to do work in the River Valley. Um, and then the current budget that uh, we're talking about today still does include one park maintenance staff to focus on natural resources. So with Council, that, questions on natural resources? <laughs> Council Member D'Alessandro. You look surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So just a couple of quick clarifications. The first one being that um, with the announcement uh, from uh, Mr. Keel earlier that we do have, in fact, a full-time facilities person coming on next week, I'm assuming that the shift we expected to see between you being part-time in this role to being more full-time will also happen. Is that a fair characterization? Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, yes. That will free me up uh, uh, probably close to half my time to focus on park maintenance and natural resources. Okay, uh, that is good news. And then there's an additional natural resources person in, in the budget here at this time. Okay, great. So then the um, only other question that I ask is what, what, I, what, I, um, what I have found through uh, folks' communication with the city is that um, the, 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 the natural resources plan um, did a good job of laying out the specifics around the, the, you know, 132 plus 24 plus the other acreages that we've got in those over 20 years. What I, what I think is a struggle still for some folks is to reconcile what's happening in parks themselves that are um, natural resources oriented. And, and what I mean by that is... Um, you can go into a park with a specific plan for natural resources, you know, restoration, right? Um, but also, as part of working in a park, you can be in much smaller increments kind of working through, you know, buckthorn removal and invasive species and all these other things. I'm, I'm wondering if we can try to highlight some of that as we come back and look at the final s budgets to be sure that, that we help people understand, regardless of where it is in the budget, what the total impact of, of, of the 2023 budget is as it relates to natural resources management. Um, it's just hard for me to grasp, and if it's hard for me to grasp and I'm kind of paying attention, uh, you know, then, then I know that it'll be more difficult for other folks. And I don't think that the natural resources plan that you laid out for us earlier this year, which was great, necessarily captures all of that. And I would hate for that to be the place that people are looking and going, oh, that's what you're spending, when, in fact, it's more comprehensive. Does that make sense? Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Also, anything additional on natural resources? On to sustainability. All right, thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. I'm here to talk about sustainability and specifically climate change. So Bloomington, along with the rest of the world, is facing many problems related to climate change, which Council recognized earlier this year with passing the and recognizing the climate crisis. Um, there's three main problems that the city is facing. The first is we're getting hotter summers, so week-long periods above 90, you know, upper 90s, and we know that many residents don't have air conditioning. It's a health problem that people are facing that we don't have conditioned spaces for these residents. We also recognize that with those hotter temperatures, we're also facing forest fires and air quality issues. So the air that we breathe, it has problems um, for residents. And then also we recognize that air conditioning takes energy and it's a greater demand on our grid and um, power outages looking at increases of those. Not only are our summers getting warmer, but our winters are getting warmer, which I know some of you might be like, yes, that's great. Um, but when you think about it, when we're going above and below 32 degrees, that means freeze and thaw, and that means ice. And that means when you're walking on sidewalks with ice, that's more falls for residents. And when you're trying to drive to work on a road with ice, that's more crashes. Um, and then also getting to the power lines, when you have ice and power lines, that's more power outages. And we know if the power went out right now, 
things would stop, right? So um, really affecting the economy and just people able to go about their daily business. And then um, along with things getting warmer, it's getting wetter. And although that might seem a little off because we're in a drought right now, um, when we do get rain, it'll be extreme rain events. And we know when we get a lot of water all at once, that's causing moving water and floods, which has huge infrastructure problems and is very costly and also causes problems like mold, um, which has health impacts as well. So... These are just a summary of some of the problems facing the community, but recognizing that climate change is affecting everything that happens in the community and is bringing problems that are costly and really impact the quality of life of everyone. So we know what we need to do. I've come here and talked about it before. Energy efficiency, electrify our buildings, use renewable energy, electrify transportation, um, look at multi multiple options for getting around, whether that's bike or transit, walk, ped, scooters. Um, all of these things take coordination and they take resources and infrastructure to build to have those behavior change. And we know that we are working under a short timeline. We have to make major strides within this decade to avoid the worst of the problems, um, both here locally and globally, um, to be able to really protect our, our well-being. So we know with the sustainability coordinator position that was created back in 2019, we've been able to do a lot more in terms of reaching towards the climate goals and the energy action plan goals of the city. But we also know that we are not moving at all near the pace that uh, council has recommended with the energy action plan um, and then also the agreement um, to work towards what's outlined in the Paris Accord. We know that there's resources being left on the table right now that could be benefiting residents that we just don't have staff capacity to be able to connect people with existing resources. And we also know that there are great opportunities coming forward with both state and federal funding opportunities that we would be able to really leverage and get done the work that we know that we need to get done. So I'll walk through two quick examples of that. So right now, for residential energy, there's two state programs, the um, Energy Assistance Program and the Weatherization Assistance Program. Combined per household, they're estimated to have about $20,000 worth of benefits. So that's um, le less days missed from work with improved air quality. That's looking at saving on your energy bills. That's getting your house insulated and paying for those um, construction materials. Right now, we have heard last year through listening sessions and engaging with community members, and we know the applications for those programs are very difficult to work through. There, these funds exist, but there many residents qualify for them and don't know about them. I don't know if you saw in the Star Trib this weekend, but 18% increase in heating bills this year. And we see from a housing affordability perspective as well, that's we're facing that so if we're able to get a hundred more households each year into these programs that's two million dollars that's going to benefit the lives of residents and especially those who are most vulnerable to these climate changes and then next upcoming federal grant opportunities which i'm most excited about these are millions of dollars that are at our footsteps and really already happening that we currently don't have the staff capacity to be able to apply to all the grants and be competitive and say, if we get these funds, we are able to implement them and carry out programs and, and use them wisely. There's the bipartisan infrastructure law and the energy efficiency conservation block grant program um, that's directly focused on local governments. All those actions we've talked about for years that's exactly what this funding is for. And we also have the Inflation Reduction Act. That's $369 billion. And for local governments specifically, there's over 10 programs that directly are related to reducing emissions in transportation sector, energy sector, looking at equity and resilience in communities. All of this money is already starting to come out and we know with the energy efficiency block grants that's looking at q1 of next year which i've already started looking into but we know with these opportunities there's this window it's amazing that we have them but if we don't have staff to really leverage right now we're losing 
potentially millions of dollars that can fund all this work, which we know will cost money to get businesses retrofitted, to get renewable energy, to look into transportation alternatives. So the ask right now in the budget is to look at an additional staff member that can really help with the outreach engagement that's needed to connect people not only to the existing resources and really have that eye towards equity and community engagement, which we've started to do, but just don't have the capacity to carry out. And then that would free up time also with the current sustainability position to really go after that grant funding to be able to support continued work and then be able to develop more programs and work with community partners to reach those goals that are outlined in the Energy Action Plan. And with that, um, any questions? Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. And this is maybe a little bit longer term, but I know I, I work with a nonprofit right now that's interested in bringing on somebody to do specifically out of uh, the Infrastructure Act, pursuing funding for alternative transportation plans, transit, things like that, and coordinating and pooling the resources of communities to work on some of those applications. Do you see similar potential for us to put coalitions of communities together to go after some of these funds? Or is every city maybe replicating this position and then going head to head for them? Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Martin. Um, I definitely see coalitions coming together. I've already started to have conversations with neighboring cities around energy efficiency um, programs, how we can be pooling our resources to think through, especially Hennepin wide, county wide, the programs that are the same for Excel and Center Point customers. Um, I definitely see this position being. There's no shortage of things to do. So even if we get grant funding to support some of this work and we have more engagement staff that come through various grants, there's still so much capacity that's needed to fill. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lohman. So um, I, I always like to ask this, this question, um, and if you don't have the off, the off the top, I don't understand, but if let's say we compare kind of how we have it arranged in terms of staffing for uh, sustainability and resilience type of stuff. We can compare some place like uh, St. Louis Park. How would we compare, you know, in terms of what they have? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, um, St. Louis Park specifically, so they started with um, similar one sustainability staff member and in the recent um, past three years they've hired two additional staff members to do more of the community outreach boots on the ground every community is a little different um, i would say that's definitely a trend where communities that have hired one sustainability staff person specifically focused on climate are now hiring additional or finding different ways to work within various departments to build capacity to do that work you know what I what I appreciate about your presentation is really talking about the, this connection between health uh, and then also the infrastructural uh, uh, components uh, of sustainability. And those are things I continue to be concerned about. Uh, and so I just I think it behooves us uh, as we kind of look at those things, as we look kind of look forward again, uh, as we uh, also looked at the. Um, our buildings and that type of thing in terms of trying to be proactive in terms of trying to bring those rates down. I just think that this uh, is something we really need to look at. And I know with the size of our community, um, you, know, if you, you know, if you do that comparison with St. Louis Park, you know, we certainly have a larger population um, than what, um, than what uh, that, that city has. And so um, I would encourage us to continue to look at this. And one of the, one final question I had for you is that, you know, if you were able to obtain some of those dollars, are you able to fund uh, uh, some of those positions through, uh, through the granting? If you, you know, I think you mentioned uh, a couple of the proposals at the federal level. Uh, is there a way to, you know, kind of take that burden off? And, and is that how St. Louis Park is, is funding some of those positions by, by getting some of those grants? Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Lohman, to my knowledge, um, St. Louis Park, they already have that staff that's not grant funded. Um, potentially, we there's still many of the details that haven't fully come out. Um, in the past, the federal funding has been more programmatic and less staff-based, but those details, again, we're waiting each day. There's updates um, as far as what we would be able to use those funds for. Well, thank you. And I, I know as we talk about, we need to be more aggressive with uh, uh, with the climate uh, crisis. 
And I certainly agree we need to do that. I just hope that we are um, as careful as we possibly can be and just be as, um, uh, uh, you know, with all due haste, move as quickly as possible, but, but really do it in a manner by which that it does not waste uh, resources, uh, 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 taxpayer resources, and that type of thing as we move forward. So again, thank you for this presentation. I look forward to seeing more. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thanks for all you do, Emma. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of work it, for one person, I'm sure. Um, do you have an expectation that the individual that you hire will, um, in this role, should we pass this, um, be able to um, hit the ground running, if you will? And, and I mean, in other words, some portion of your time is currently spent on this, and therefore the transition would not necessarily be um, that this person has you know, a six month ramp to get up to that, up to speed. I'm just wondering how quickly you think we might be able to start seeing some of the benefit you identify here. Mr. Mayor, council members, council member D'Alessandro, um, there's always onboarding that takes time. I think, for example, right now we're putting on energy resource workshops. So we had the first one last week um, and we have, you know, two more coming up. Right now, that's my time, you know, coordinating and being at those events in the evening, which, you know, is great. I, I love that work. But that's also something that I think we would be able to train someone in pretty quickly to be able to do more of those engagement events that could bring back feedback from the community, work with some of our community partners to be able to carry those out. So that's work that could happen immediately. And I see then that freeing up time, especially in Q1 of next year, to go up after those grant funds because that will take a significant lift to be able to get those done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so as we think about how we can bring this back together and talk about sustainability, there's two things, and maybe this is for you, Mr. City Manager, as, as you kind of think about pulling this together. N number one is um, that it's, it's clear that this is important. And so to the extent that we can consolidate and or transfer the priority of resources that are internal to us. So for example, that sounds a lot like a community outreach and engagement issue. And if there's something that they're doing right now that they should stop doing in order to do this, I think we all agree up here as council that this is a higher priority. That's what we've said, right? So something to consider there. I don't, you know, if we can shift resources to focus on these areas of opportunity, I think that would be very smart. Um, I, the second thing I would say then um, is uh, as, as we think about this um, uh, on an overall basis, um, uh, I, I like the, I, I, and I don't know if this is where you were going, Councilmember Martin, but you know, to the extent that somebody like uh, Richfield or something like a Dino or something like an Eden Prairie cannot support this effectively and it's in our best interest to do this can we create a public health oriented kind of model that says we're going to do this and we're going to do it right and you can pay us to be a beneficiary of it because it it's all the same right these energy assistance programs weatherization programs um you know solar install programs all those things they're very similar you know city to city there's not there's only a few things that are probably super specific to Bloomington versus Richfield versus anything else. And, you know, can we make traction on that? So another thing to consider, um, considering it's a strategic priority for the city. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I do love that issue. I mean, climate change is a public health issue, so I think it makes sense, um, especially as we already uh, work across those jurisdictions from a public health perspective. Um, so I guess I just... So I really appreciate the presentation, and I, it is remarkable how much work that you're getting done, mm -hmm. and it's just you. And so um, recognize that you need more people helping you to do this work. Um, I do have just a clarifying question, and this might be for the city manager. I think it was last year or the year before we hired a – we approved a, a new FTE around grants and reporting. And I guess I'm just curious. I assume that this person would be helping um, and that Emma would be more involved from, like, a strategy – kind of developing out what those would look like from a content perspective, but not actually doing the grant, grant writing. Mr. Brugge. Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, Council Member Carter, uh, I would say we do have new grants person on. That was a new ad for this year's budget. This year. Janet Burns is our uh, grant coordinator. Uh, she's doing an excellent job, and she's uh, 
been focused this year on uh, grant compliance and reporting and uh, pulling together everything that we have. So I don't think that we have fully started to deploy her on the other side of the grants. Um, and I think we probably need to assess what uh, you know bandwidth we have there uh, or see if we need other um, resources to help with the, the grant side. Because last year, remember I told you, we're looking for a unicorn. Uh, and I think we found a unicorn. She, she has experience on both sides of the grants. Uh, that's not the issue. It's just the bandwidth of being able to manage the reporting and the compliance and then also doing the work on the um, pursuing and the writing side, which is actually uh, just as time intensive. So mm -hmm. I know one other department has already identified that um, they probably have more um, uh, time that they would like to see in the pursuit of grants than, than what that one person is able to accommodate. So that's just a capacity that we're going to have to evaluate going forward. Okay. And a lot of that compliance and reporting was related to the ARPA funds, right? The it's a significant amount of it, yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. And, and then, okay. if I can jump in, yeah. um, specifically we thought the energy efficiency block grant was going to come out in Q4 so we already started working on that um, how it was set up is that I would be doing the writing and kind of the subject area expertise but then Janet would definitely be able to help kind of with the logistics and making sure we're meeting deadlines and and the process so it's more process support than the the writing and strategy part got it I guess I would be interested just as we kind of project out, like from a cl compliance perspective, I mean, do we need somebody that's focused on compliance and then do we need somebody that's focused on grants? I'm not trying to create another position, but um, there are so many resources out there that we could be leveraging if we had somebody who could be writing grants full time. Um, and then just a quick question. Do you work with somebody in co-ed? I work with everyone in co-ed, okay, depending that's what on I what thought. department so I I'm I, working I with. thought so, because yeah. I had remembered co-ed folks involved in some of the sustainability events. And so um, so it sounds like you do have a good working relationship with that team. And Definitely. The, okay, thank you. Council, anything additional on sustainability? All right. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. Emma. And we will, One more. Uh, we will move on to our final budget discussion of the evening, item 5.5. This is our legal department budget, saving the most scintillating for last, exactly. <laughs> Matt has a PowerPoint. No, they can stay down there. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. So generally speaking, um, we have, uh, just as by way of introduction, we have uh, Wendy Murphy and Peter Zunica here with us in person tonight. Um, they are the deputy city attorneys uh, on the criminal and civil team. And uh, on the telephone, we have Amira Malik, who is winding down um, a very long day three on the job. Um, and so hopefully we won't have any questions for him, but he is our newest uh, division lead in the compliance uh, manager position. So uh, he is on the WebEx, but um, hopefully I could answer any questions that you have for him. Uh, so generally speaking, our preliminary budget that we proposed to Jamie back in August um, included several positions, and um, they are, uh, and then I, um, in, in, with the assistance of Peter and Wendy and some others, uh, came up with the an interim strategy um, that is reflected here. Um, so by way of introduction uh, to the chart that you're looking at here, we, um, in our original budget request, asked for uh, a part-time staff person to be increased to full-time uh, administrative assistance, and then our, our staff person that handles uh, evidence to be uh, duplicated, to have two people, and I'll get into the details of that in a little bit. Um, what I proposed to Jamie a couple weeks ago and he signed off on uh, is that we are going to elevate um, the part-time staff person to full-time immediately, uh, and that person is going to be using the balance of their time to be assisting with evidence um, 
responses. Uh, and so that's reflected in this budget here that you're looking at. Um, we were able to realize um, some savings um, on the personnel front in order to be able to do this um, because of the um, all of the hiring that HR has been doing and been very, very busy. And so we weren't able to bring on Amir and Lorpu, um, the other compliance staff person until um, these most recent months of September and October, and we had budgeted since mid-month, or mid-year rather. So we had a little bit of money available to um, cover that personnel um, time period there, and certainly have the demand. So um, appreciate Jamie's willingness for, uh, to lean into the creativity that I sent him a while back. So next slide. Well, and probably the next slide. All right, so an overview of our department here. We have 19 total staff, and they are spread through uh, three divisions, and then we borrow, um, well, not borrow, we share, rather, um, our risk and litigation manager with the finance department. So um, we have, in the civil division, um, Peter Zuniga leading that up. We have some attorneys. We have a paralegal, and then we have, in red, that administrative assistant that moved from uh, part-time to full-time. Uh, and then on the criminals team, we have the deputy city attorney, we have the four prosecutors, a paralegal, uh, an office support specialist, off two office assistants that are part-time. They're at the folks at the front desk that open cases and um, prepare the calendars for the prosecutors. We have these as two part-time positions because um, we want more hours of coverage, frankly. Um, and if we just go with one position, we only get 40 hours of coverage, but we want more, and as a way of managing the budget, we opted for two part-time a couple of years ago. So far, that's working um, maybe a couple of years from now. We'll talk about it again. Um, and then we have the Crime Victim Liaison, which is a grant-funded position um, that we've talked to you about in the past a couple of times. Um, this is a, a match um, with some federal and state funds. In the Compliance Division, the brand new, um, we have Amir Malik, who's the new Compliance Manager, and then um, a paralegal that uh, will be supporting that division as well, who also is a part of our team. So from a high level here, um, I listed a note on the bottom about law clerks. Uh, we have periodically used law clerks. We don't use them enough, frankly. Um, law clerks are, are smart um, and inexpensive relative to um, the services that they're able to provide. And frankly, we don't have the capacity as attorneys um, to be doing, in our support staff, to be doing the legal research. Um, we end up doing it at night, um, by and large, um, part because there's meetings all day long. So um, law clerks are a way that we've used in the past to address some of our challenges. Um, in the past, we've used unpaid interns. Um, they get um, class credit um, for their time, and, um, and then we get their intern time. The challenge with that method, although cost effective, is it's not terribly reliable, um, and uh, their availability is quite limited. So uh, that's a high-level overview of the department. Um, and we identified some other challenges um, in our budget proposal, but I'll, I'll save that for as we progress. The next slide um, is something that we have prepared to give you actually a full presentation on tonight. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, especially given that it's 1022, it was a good choice, um, we condensed it down into one slide, which would have been a 15-minute presentation. So Wendy um, was uh, our criminal uh, uh, deputy, was prepared to give you a very, very thorough discussion on uh, an update on these topics. But um, I'll just give you the highlights, and then if you have specific questions, Wendy is here and can answer those. Um, our restorative court and our diversion were two um, efforts that grew out of our racial equity action team. They launched mid-year in this past year, and um, I think, frankly, um, would not have happened without Wendy and other people's efforts. And we were recently awarded um, a, an award um, for this, these efforts and, and some others related to racial equity. So I, I'm really proud of this work and the work that our, uh, that our team is doing on it. So with regard to restorative court, it seeks to restore individuals. Uh, it's connecting them with a social worker so that they can exit the system. Um, this is, if you recall, um, we brought this to you a couple months ago, a Hennepin County grant with a match. 60% is paid by the city and 40% by the county. It's a two-year commitment. 
There's basic eligibility requirements uh, and, and disqualifying criteria that will keep people out of the program. So far, there have been 62 cases referred and 34 of them have been accepted. We're going to continue to evaluate this um, as we go, uh, and um, we'll be available to provide additional updates. It's still in its you know relative infancy. Uh, it's a brand new court um, for Hennepin County, so um, we're all growing into it. The second thing that we wanted to talk to you about is diversion, which we are working with the entity Justice Point to bring you that program. Um, they were able to receive some grant funds that brought down the cost of providing this option for defendants down to $25 per defendant, and it seemed like at that point it was something that we could participate in uh, realistically. So the goal of diversion is to address the issues that contributed to the um, offenses that the defendants ha have committed and to um, hopefully result, if they participate in the specific programming requirements, um, successfully to get them um, to result in the dismissal of their charges. So we've had about 70 folks so far participate in diversion. Um, and again, have some additional statistics on that, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna keep moving. So the next slide. One more, one more. All right, so the thing about uh, revenues, I put it in quotes, because we don't really seek to generate revenue in the legal department, that's not our mission. Um, we seek compliance specifically. Uh, we seek rest restoration, and we we work hard to get people valid. Um, so, for example, and I think very simplistically, um, we will work extra hard. We'll have more hearings. We'll give people more time so that they can get their driver's license back, get whatever um, underlying things taken care of so they can get their driver's license, so they can get to work, so that they can do all the other things that they need to do. Um, and also, too, the things that we just, that I just mentioned, uh, diversion and rest restorative court, um, they, as you probably could work through, um, are going to result in less, quote-unquote, revenue from fines because people are having their underlying conditions addressed. Um, but what we do um, sort of bring, for lack of a better word, to as far as revenues is the fines. And then we also um, are able to charge a, a a, a moderate fee for uh, discovery requests. Um, we have to manage that, um, and we are mindful of what that fee is, but we're able to charge a, a modest fee for that service. Next slide. So um, our, I was joking with Carla that I was looking for a slide that said, get paid to think. Um, so we think, um, and we write stuff down, and we go to court, um, and um, <laughs> um, essentially, it's, it's an expensive undertaking. Um, uh, so from the technology uh, perspective, um, we have uh, several, sev we leverage as much as we can with technology. Um, we use a Westlaw, um, which is a case, um, a case research entity, that, uh, case research um, software. That's about $37,000 a year. Um, we also work with a third party entity called Tybex that um, helps us uh, utilize our case management system and has been integral um, this year and a couple of years prior to this um, to creating a lot of operational integrations that allow us to um, not only be more accurate in our data entry, but essentially eliminate data entry as much as possible. We also have to pay Hennepin County for access to its software system so that we can participate and prosecute cases. And then we work the police department. We have a, a portal um, that we work with, with evidence.com, that relates to the Axon uh, body camera footage. So, and we also use it to manage all of our other discovery. It all flows into evidence.com. Uh, the second part that I wanted to chat about is the legal assistance. Um, we use not only, I mentioned, um, law clerks um, and outside counsel, um, but um, as you know, we um, have our coverage through the League of Minnesota Cities Insurance Trust, and if we do not have coverage um, for an event, then we need to manage that with internal resources. And um, we have used outside counsel as well. We have also used outside counsel as a resource for um, things that we 
um, cannot cost effectively do internally. Uh, so a lot of access, as you can tell from the technology um, bullet point I just mentioned, uh, information costs money um, and you need to subscribe to these portals and these systems and whatnot and it's not a cost effective for us to subscribe to everything so um, sometimes it's more cost effective for us to pay another law firm to go and do something for us quickly than to subscribe to something for a whole year um, the next bullet point is downtown court costs uh, and this these costs are the result of us being moved from um, the closure of the South Town Court to downtown Minneapolis a couple of years ago. So we pay um, a lot of money in parking. Now that we're moving, now that we're back in person, um, we will again be paying a lot of money in parking uh, and um, travel costs down to um, downtown. We did have a hiatus um, for paying for those during COVID when we were remote, um, but now we're back to largely in person. Uh, the next thing um, that... Um, we have been working on, we, we're working intensely with the Federal Reserve for many months um, to do some research for us based on outcomes for our um, work, both on the civil and the criminal side. Tracking outcomes, working with um, the various uh, types of demographic data to analyze our work. Um, we received notice from the Federal Reserve a couple of months ago that they're not going to be able to do that work for us. Um, and the and the best one of the great things about it was that they were willing to do it for free. Um, so we have done some research um, for their other options that they proposed, and um, that's about twenty thousand dollars. We so, so we will likely we were not able to get that finished this year um, due to some other priorities, but. Um, likely we'll be asking to carry over that money into 2023. That's a preview. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> ink, ink, please. Um, the last one is professional development. So um, in order for us to do what we do, we have to be licensed and we have to go and have continuing legal education credits um, to maintain our licenses. We also have um, paralegals who need training periodically to um, stay up to date on the latest technology and information. They have other um, types of learning opportunities as well. The other thing that we've done this past year that I'm, I think has been going pretty well is some professional development. And with the addition of five new staff people, I hope to continue to do some of that next year as well. Um, we have had quarterly trainings. Um, we did some team building and one of them we looked at um, and um, had some training on secondary trauma, um, which is not enough time to talk about tonight, but definitely something that we are mindful of. Uh, and then um, wellness, working in the remote environment, which I'll get into a little bit more on a subsequent slide. And then um, I know all of our staff is looking forward to the fourth and final of the year, which is something on technical writing. All right, next slide. So I uh, suggested that we're going to be talking about the future here, and that's what's um, on this next slide here. So I've mentioned the evidence and the evidence challenges that we have. Wendy gave me some updated statistics. Th so through October 24th, we're now at 18,000 and some change items that we've processed through evidence.com. Again, that's being done by one staff person. And if you look at the incremental growth, it's just not sustainable, even with our integrations and our technology that we've been um, uh, working to deploy, uh, we just need more. We just need more bandwidth, and we frankly need more resiliency in the position. Because every now and then, the staff person would like to take a vacation, um, and um, so we're working on that. And hopefully, this um, part-time position shifting over will assist with that. Um, there, um, the 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 growth in this is in in part due to um, more entities coming online using body cameras, but also just the growth in um, the use of digital recording and, um, and some other factors in, in the world as well. Um, so it's something that is probably not going to change and, and we're predicting, predicting additional growth. Uh, I mentioned outside counsel. Um, we will continue to probably need to leverage that in the future. Um, we run lean, uh, as you've heard many times um, during these budget presentations, and legal is no different. Um, so when we um, have a you know a staff uh, vacancy or an extended leave of absence or anything like that. We struggle to just 
cover our court calendars. Uh, so we have been able to add an additional prosecutor um, in that Wendy is able to pr make appearances in court as well, but she's also managing a fairly large staff um, and needs to cover you know, when the person who manages evidence is not in the office and all those other things. So we're doing our best, but it's, it's quite lean. Uh, and, um, well, I'll say that for the couple bullets later. Uh, the other thing I wanted to make you aware of is our reliance on, um, the grant for the crime victim liaison. Um, our, our victim liaison is doing amazing work, uh, reaching out and, and, you know, sends us these gut wrenching yet amazing emails about how, um, things go sometimes very successfully. Um, and people are, victims are able to participate, um, in their court uh, process and, um, in the benefits of that on many different levels. And so we don't want to do anything to jeopardize our, um, our staff position there. That said, the current grant that we have in, in, in September of 23, and we have been made aware um, that it's going to be a very competitive future um, rounds of the grant. So um, we're doing the, everything we can think of to be well positioned to be competitive, and we hope that we will be. Um, we're doing great work um, and um, putting on some great events, um, especially this month. Um, there are a couple yet happening um, later this month. So um, we hope that that will reflect well in our application. Uh, the other thing is the, the law clerks that I mentioned. Um, really would like to see a way to make that work just to give us a little bit more capacity um, inexpensively. Uh, and then um, speaking to capacity, uh, we are um, we we are managing with what we have, um, but when there are additional initiatives and projects, um, say for example a World's Fair, um, that we will struggle. Um, I found some information, or I got some information provided me today um, about the number of contracts that we're processing, um, and the the volume is just growing. Um, we are about 30 contracts below right now, below the record that we set last year for the number of contracts we processed. So we'll certainly exceed that record again this year. Uh, it's just incredible volume. And when you divide it by the number of people that are, that are doing the work. Um, so just something to be mindful of. Uh, and I know Jamie hears me chirp about this all the time. We're doing what I can, what we can um, to manage, you know, to use technology, for example, DocuSign. Uh, in the past, we did everything, you know, literally by paper. Um, and now we're processing, I want to say, like 1,600 documents a year, um, around somewhere around there with using DocuSign. So that's been a great uh, technological improvement and, frankly, saved us a ton of money on paper. Um, so... Um, the one thing, the one last thing I wanted to mention, because I've talked a lot about our capacity and our and our staffing levels, is that um, one of the things that we have rolled out this past year in 2022 is something to frankly help the budget situation at the city, and that is that we are hoteling. Um, we're the only department that is doing it, and that basically means that we don't have enough workspaces for all of our employees in legal, and so the folks that have dedicated. Um, to be in the office more than 50% have a workspace, and those that um, have to go other places for work, for example, court or um, or prefer to work at home, um, they are doing that, and they do not have a workspace. Um, they, a dedicated workspace, they reserve one, um, and um, we have been working on that process. Um, it was um, quite a big deal at first, um, and we did a, survey about how it's going a couple weeks ago so we'll be perhaps making some tweaks um, but uh, it was a big deal um, and um, again to address the budget situation um, and then the last thing is that we did ask Jamie in our budget or not just Jamie I guess all of y'all um, for some money to redesign uh, a workspace that we have um, that's just not very efficient and that stuff is expensive 20 grand just to have the consultants come in and draw the designs. So um, uh, we we know that we're ineffectively or inefficiently using a large about about maybe about a I don't know what do you think Jamie about maybe a fourth of our office space that one corner up there anyway it doesn't matter um, it's late uh, and so we just think we could use it more efficiently but it's twenty grand to figure out how so. Um, that's a high-level overview, and I know that Peter and Wendy are here, and I know that we have Amir on the line, so if there's any other questions, be happy to tackle those. Thank you. Council, questions? Councilmember Lohman. So, um, 
So with the downtown expenses, is there any way to, uh, since you guys are hoteling, is there a way to uh, just have somebody, and maybe you already do, I'm, I, I don't uh, get into the details of it, have somebody just downtown permanently to just handle that, and then that might cut back on space needs and then maybe the need to park if you, if you got something permanent down there? Uh, so, Mayor members, uh, that uh, that's an intriguing idea. Although it doesn't really, it won't really work because when we're downtown, we have at least two people there. Um, so we're assigned certain days that we have that were assigned uh, our calendars, and we have two prosecutors that are there either in the morning or in the afternoon, or they go there for the whole day, depending upon how they're scheduled. So um, we're not there every day. Um, we're there a couple of days a week, and then we're there when we have trials. So, um, so there it is... certainly could be a shared expense. Sorry to jump in. I know we're short on time. So it could mm -hmm. be a shared expense among maybe multiple uh, uh, suburban areas that have, have the same issue maybe? So the other jurisdictions that are down there that are suburban is the MAC mm -hmm. and uh, Richfield and then Bloomington. Um, all the other jurisdictions are out in the suburbs. Um, the... I mean, I can certainly look into it. I don't, I can't think of anything that would, I can't think of anything that would make me think that it would be possible. And of course, um, my next question, sort of is there a way speaking? for us to move to another suburban court? No, I, thought. I mean, not, doesn't, one, they can't accommodate us because we're huge, mm -hmm. huge calendars, but then two, it's not any cheaper because it's not close. Cool. Um, I've got some other questions, but I'm just going to ask you those offline in the interest of time. Okay. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just uh, real briefly, uh, I was saving the question for now, but maybe it was better in the IT presentation. I, I guess just a reminder, we've talked about it before, but I, I'm wondering in our legislative priorities how some of these items like all the cities that are using systems like Axon, I've got to imagine if the state was negotiating that contract, they might have some more weight to throw around with something like that. But especially with the amount of evidence that we're processing now, not only from a staff perspective, but the data storage itself, it, whether whatever cloud systems we're using or... So I, I wonder down the line if we could get some more information just about are there states out there that are negotiating this on behalf of municipalities? Because i got to imagine we could drive down costs quite a bit if it was from that way. Mr. Berbrugge? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Council Members, Council Member Mike, uh, Martin, my understanding is that the uh, Axon is on the state contract, but there's a fair amount of uh, customization that goes on from one agency to another. Um, which is, uh, you know, part of the issue that we had to work through earlier this year as we were negotiating that agreement, is trying to figure out exactly what are um, <clears throat> the different elements of uh, the body camera system, and then, as the chief mentioned earlier, you know, the the fact that you get tasers as part of it and and other um, equipment that goes with it. So uh, it's it's not just a straightforward um, issue of whether it's just a, a, a simple contract amount. There's a lot more um, distinction between different agencies. Yeah. And Mayor Members, I'll add that we build our integrations around, the, around that, how it's coming into us, the data. And so um, whenever, you know, the police department talks about tweaking something, we sort of like freak out like we just spent all this money on this integration so um we have to be mindful of sort of the ripple effect because we all are synced up literally you know through the technology now councilmember coulter and councilmember d'alessandro councilmember coulter thank you mayor i'll be quick i'm just i'm in the five years i've been on the council now i've noticed it, it feels like a pretty consistent pattern that we're we're talking about capacity issues when it comes to our legal staff whether it's data practices act requests or processing evidence or contracts or whatever it is. And I, I think from my perspective, it, it may be time for us to just have a larger conversation about what staff capacity looks like in the legal department and how we are addressing that perhaps in a more sort of fulsome way beyond every year we hear about it during budget decisions and, and what is the sort of overarching plan to address that because I, I mean, I, you know, to borrow your the city attorney's line, I mean, our, our staff want to take vacations and, and they want to do all those things that, you know, people do. And, and I'm, I'm very, very concerned. I mean, I'm concerned about burnout for all of our staff, but in particular, I'm, I'm very concerned about burnout for our legal staff. And I just want to make sure that we are addressing that, that what seems to be a, a recurring issue in a more sort of intentional way. I appreciate that. Uh, that we worked a lot this weekend, so that's particularly relevant. So thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Thank you. Quick question, um, 
Ms. Manshai, do you, you don't have, I'm, I'm going to assume I know the answer to this question, but I don't want to. You can't do pro bono as attorneys right now, right? Uh, Mayor members, I'm not exactly sure I understand what you're saying. Me- meaning I know that generally speaking from both an ethical and kind of a professional perspective, pro bono work is something that, you know, your attorneys generally are encouraged to do. But I would think it would be very hard for you all to be finding fi- finding time to do that. Uh, Mayor members, I can't speak for um, my colleagues. I know that I'll, several of them do pro bono work. I, I do pro bono work. Um, I... I volunteer with the Domestic Abuse Law Center in uh, Ramsey County, um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that others uh, do stuff too. So on top of all the work that you're doing here, you're trying to do that too, which is really my point is that to underscore that it's it's actually relev- important from a, a legal perspective that lawyers are able to do that as part of their ethical practices and everything. And so I would only underscore uh, – Councilmember Coulter's point that we should probably look at this a little bit more holistically. Um, and so I support that. Um, question for you about the outcomes research portion here. You mentioned um, that uh, that um, uh, that we would um, – we're looking at the, diff- I guess, different demographics and everything. Is the is the information about the success of the restorative court and, and diversion programs – was it intended that that would go in there maybe even before the Fed decided not to help you anymore? But was was that part of the, the intention at the time? Uh, Mayor members, we were actually looking at this Federal Reserve research before then. So like a year, probably two years ago, two years ago, uh, we wanted to launch it. Um, frankly, getting the data to do the research is really challenging um, in that we want self-reported data, not um um, educated guesses or, you know, um, that sort of thing. So we, so getting that data is tricky. Um, and, um, there are limited sources of that data, but then, um, uh, we wanted to also look at all sort of types of the work that we do. So not just the prosecution, but also the civil work, um, and, um, and figuring out how to technically do that and to capture that that um, demographic data has been tricky, um, but but we also learned that we, we don't think anybody else is doing it. Um, so we really we really really want to do it. It's just a matter of frankly timing, finding the time to set up all the conversations to get it going. And okay, that. well, so that so I'm very much looking forward to as the program continues us looking at outcome based information on those two programs as well. Um, maybe mm-hmm. that's not included yeah. in that. Then. It's a part of the data collection, isn't it, Wendy? The demographic data on restorative court and diversion? Yes. Yeah, we're collecting it there. Okay, great. Yeah, mm-hmm. thank you. Um, the last thing I was going to say is just a thought um, between the fact that we now are very close to the orange line, as is downtown. Downtown, Maybe if we could figure out a way for you all to get bus passes and things like that, and you guys could back and forth as opposed to being from here, that would be amazing. But I also throw out that maybe you could get a parking space on a monthly contract and just share the pass. So just some things to throw out there as ideas. Mayor, Mayor members, um, we did used to have a parking pass uh, that we, we used. Um, we shared it. We had two spots and four people shared it, or five people shared it. And so we did. We have done that. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about that more online or offline. Sure. Um, uh, and we do have members, our prosecutors, that take public transit from awesome. there. Okay. Not necessarily from here, but we have the folks that do that. Yeah, just some ideas. Thank you, yeah. Mayor. Council, anything else for Ms. Manderscheid? If not, thank you very much. And that wraps up our budget discussions for this evening. So thanks to all the staff who provided information and detail on that. Very detailed and, uh, and, and good stuff. It's I think if folks would have any questions about the budgets and the budget questions coming up, uh, all they have to do is watch this and and could understand quite a bit. We'll move on to item 5.6, our City Council Policy and Issue Update. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Two items I wanted to share with Council this evening. First, um, City staff has been working with our colleagues at the County, uh, especially the um, folks at the county who are working with families experiencing uh, housing instability. Uh, since June of this year, they have been experiencing uh, quite an uptick in terms of the numbers of families that are requiring um, sheltering services. And then recently, that uh, uptick was um, 
uh, exacerbated uh, by the fact that they had a facility with uh, maintenance issues that went down. So they have a placement problem too. Uh, county approached city, uh, let them know that uh, they had this, let us know that they had this need. Uh, had already talked to the Holiday Inn at 94th and 35W, which the, you'll recall the county had previously contracted with that hotel for sheltering uh, during the pandemic uh, and uh, wanted to let us know that they were interested in using that facility. Um, our staff talked to them about uh, just getting some certain assurances about uh, making sure that there was appropriate uh, safety planning in place and management. Um, so here's here's uh, uh, what we're looking at is that the families that are being served tend to be single parents with younger children. Um, they are not being um, housed. Uh, it, it truly is shelter. So it's temporary and transitional. Uh, they don't expect that any of the clients will be uh, in the, in the um, facility for uh, more than 29 days. Uh, they will be providing on-site supervision 24 hours. They also have um, on-site services that are going to be provided, including uh, congregate dining, which they are providing. Uh, and then they also have um, uh, contracted security that will be there at all times, too. Uh, clients are also required to uh, sign a code of conduct, and um, you know if they fail to abide by that, then um, they're they're terminated from the services that are being provided. So uh, we wanted to make sure that the uh, county had a good working solution um, for what their need is right now. Uh, we expect it's going to be somewhere between 50 to 100 family units at any one time in the hotel, and they've told us that the maximum amount of time that they plan to be there is for about six months. Um, so uh, I think that um, our public safety staff uh, will be in touch with theirs. Um, if you'll recall back during the pandemic, when they were operating it, they had a little bit of a rocky start, but after they put those same provisions in place, um, we had uh, very few issues over there. And so uh, I think we're pretty confident here that the, the county has run a good operation and, and um, you know we want to try to provide for what their needs are, especially in a time of crisis. So that's one item. Uh, any questions there? No, I, I would just uh, echo what you just said there. The, the, the county, after the rocky start, had a, a good run uh, they, they understood our concerns. I think they understood what the uh, what we were hearing from the residents of Bloomington and what our our public safety concerns, what our social welfare concerns were, and reacted accordingly. And so, based on lessons learned from their part, and frankly, lessons learned from our part about what to have the uh, what conversations to have before we moved on uh, in this process like this, uh, I'm confident. I'm much more confident uh, about a successful outcome for this. And frankly, I. As we head into into November here, and we're if they have uh, housing issues with uh, with some of their transitional housing, if the options are to not do this or to do this for single mothers with with young children, my my sense is we do this, and we support them in the best way that we can, holding them accountable and making sure that the things that we've laid out are met, the requirements that uh, we've put before them are not uh, they're they're not just looked over or, or shunned to the side, but they are actually met. And I think then uh, I'm very comfortable that we're going to have a, a positive outcome for all of this. Okay. Also, any questions or any other comments on that? Council Member Lohman. So just one, one thought that crossed my mind. So then the, the hotel itself, would that be, uh, wouldn't be accessible by the general public during that period of time at all, would it? Or? Um, I, I forgot to ask that question, Council Member, so I don't know if they're going to be... Um, maintaining it only for the county I, and the only the only concern i had with that was just you know i get uh, just you know trafficking and those kind of things um, yeah actually the city attorney reminded me that yeah their plan is to have it exclusively for the county okay. service okay yeah. so then no i don't have those concerns yep. all right great second thing mr Ruby? uh the second item is just a a process announcement <clears throat> that I shared with the council, but thought we'd share with the community too. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we had the delegation from the Bureau of International Expositions here in Bloomington and Minnesota and Washington, D.C. to evaluate the Expo 2027 application. 
Uh, last Friday, the BIE announced that they were advancing the Minnesota USA proposal along with the other uh, four applicants for consideration by the full General Assembly. So uh, they, what that means is they have found our application to be um, viable and consistent with the BIE rules and um, are moving it forward for consideration in the next step. And I think it's important to note that's the first time in 40 years since the United States has taken this step in a World Expo uh, bid. So it's, a, it's big news. And I still can't believe other locations made the cut, but I won't get into <laughs> that right now. I don't want to create an international. No, I do not. Here. Not at this. Eleven o'clock. Not at this hour. Night. Absolutely not. Any questions on that, Council? Anything? Just a quick review for folks who are still watching of our listening session earlier this evening. Uh, Sally Ness spoke to the council, and we had an ongoing discussion about the difference between public and private schools and whether or not charter schools fit which definition. And so that conversation continued. Uh, Mr. I think it was Mike List. Was that his last name? Mike List uh, came before us, offered some feedback on the most recently uh, discussed survey, that uh, the, the citizen survey that was done, and then talked about uh, fire safety indicators. Obviously, he's, he's paying attention and, and is interested in this kind of thing, and we had a good conversation with Mr. List on, on some of those things. And finally, Mr. Dale Johnson came forward. He had some questions specific to the information in this month's Bloomington briefing regarding the survey done by the Morris Leatherman Company uh, over the summer, and we had a good discussion about uh, some of those uh, survey results and directed him specifically to spots uh, on the city website where you could find more information about a variety of different things. And so that was a good discussion we had with Mr. Johnson as well. I have nothing else, Council. Do you, Council members have anything this evening? Council Member D'Alessandro. Very quickly, just want to say thank you to everybody that turned up to my town hall last week. Um, it was lively. And uh, and well attended, so I, I'm really excited. I think I win so far. You had more, but that's because you're the mayor. Oh. But uh, yeah, there was no there's no competition, obviously. But I think we had 25 or so people. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it was really, it was really wonderful. Uh, and I really appreciate the energy and the uh, effort that people put in to show up. Good. So thanks. Good to hear. Council Member Coulter. Uh, just very quick, Mayor. I'm sure most folks watching at 10.56 already know this, but um, this is our last meeting before Election Day, so just want to encourage folks to get out and vote. Election Day is November 8th. Early voting has obviously already started. You can vote uh, here at Civic Plaza Monday through Friday, 8 to 4.30, and I believe there are hours on the Saturday before Election Day, but not the Sunday, um, but Monday before Election Day as well. So everybody get out and uh, exercise your civic duty. Thank you for the reminder. Anything else, Council? Hearing nothing else, Council, I'd look for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Got a motion and a second to adjourn this evening. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Motion carries 7-0. We are adjourned. Thank you much, Council. Good discussion tonight. On a, it, was, it was a tough night, a, tough decisions, but uh, thanks much for the discussion that we did have. Thank you to uh, the folks who that were here this evening. Thanks to staff for the great information and the great work. Good night, everyone.